I'm a 23 year old guy and just recently started my first job. You may be wondering why this is my first job if I'm 23. Well, that's because since I was 16 years old, I took care of my grandmother who had COPD, so I had no time to really commit to a job, as if I ever left her alone, she'd be forced into a nursing home, and I could never let that happen. So I made the choice to put my life on hold until the time came when I'd be able to commit to a job. My grandmother recently passed away, so I was now able to get a steady job to get some money to pay bills and such. I applied for a job at my local video rental store, and I got the job pretty quickly, as the manager really took a liking to me. I was trained within a week and put into the night shift. Now, our night shifts aren't anything crazy. They're pretty dead, as a matter of fact. You'll get the occasional customer who will walk in, get a movie, and be on their way. You sometimes get those creeps who come in for the adult movies at 9pm and such, but nothing too crazy. That is, until two weeks into my working at this store, that the most scariest thing happened to me. I came into work around 7pm, which was my usual time to work. I'd work until 10 or 11pm, given which day it would be. Once I got there, I did my usual routine with my coworker who worked the shift before me of counting the drawers, getting any info they needed me to have, and then they'd leave. I had got probably about one hour into my shift, which made it 8 p.m. now, when a man walked through the door with his hood over his head. Anytime someone came in, I'd always say hello, and most would reply back saying hello or give some kind of gesture, but this guy didn't. In fact, it was as if he completely ignored me and just walked off into the store to a corner where I could barely see him. Now, let me give you a little detail about the conditions for when this took place, as it fits into the story. It was January, and it was cold out. So the man had a heavy jacket on, which covered him up pretty well. His hood covered his face enough to where I could barely make it out at first. All I could see when he looked my way was the white of his eyes as they looked at me. Eventually, he made his way to where I could completely see him fully, as he had taken his hood down from his head. Now, I'm not a guy who gets creeped out often, but when I see this guy, I immediately felt uneasy. He was a black man in his mid-30s with short cropped hair. He had what looked to be a scar on his cheek along with tattoos all over his neck. He glanced at me as I was looking at him, and his eyes met mine. I can't begin to explain how creeped out I was by this. I simply looked down at my computer and pretended it hadn't affected me, even though I know he knew it did. Eventually, I glanced back up to see the man was now approaching me at the front counter. In my head, I just wanted to check this guy out and get him out of there, as I was getting more uncomfortable the longer he was there, as it was just him and I in the store at the time. As he approached, I could see his face much more clearer now. He had no expression on his face, but his eyes looked at me as if he had hate towards me. He slammed his movie on the counter with a gesture of intimidation. I was a bit thrown off as I didn't know this guy or why he was acting this way towards me. I slowly leaned up from my computer and stumbled out the words. Is there something wrong, sir? I was so creeped out, I didn't even realize how shaky and uneasy my voice was. It sounded as if I was so scared by him that I could barely even get a word out. The man just looked at me for what felt like forever before replying, I want to rent this movie, but I need you to do one thing for me. At this point, I just wanted the guy out of my store, so I replied back with, What would that be, sir? Now, my store has very specific rules on what to do when a person seems hostile towards you. So, I was already planning out the plan I would put into motion in my head if it got to that point. The man looked me over a couple of times making me feel very uneasy, before he slowly leaned forward. As he spoke, his breath hit my face. It smelled of weed, alcohol, and like he hadn't brushed his teeth in forever. I want you to give me all of the money you have there in that register. I immediately froze. I immediately froze where I stood as the man slammed a gun down onto the counter and pointed it at me. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest and ears. I began to shake and I could feel sweat rolling down my forehead. I didn't dare move, 
I didn't even raise my hands as I didn't want him to think I was trying anything. I felt myself struggle to get any words out before I finally did. Take all that you want. It's in the drawer in front of me. You can get it so you know I won't do anything. He grinned a nasty yellow smile at me before slowly making his way around the counter to the register. I then stepped back as he pulled it open and began filling in his pockets with the money. Now, I'm not stupid. I know working a night shift always leaves the chance of something like this happening, and I've heard plenty of horror stories about this type of stuff happening to others, which is why I always carry a large pocket knife on me at all times. I slowly slid my hand down into my left pocket and grabbed my knife tightly in my hand. So tight my hand went numb. As the man turned around, he then looked at me before pointing the gun back at me. I just knew he wasn't going to let me go. I'd seen his face, and this seemed like the type of guy who didn't want anything left behind that could tie back to him. All I could think was, this is where I was going to die. Right here, on the floor of this video rental store I called my first job. He inched closer to me and began to speak slowly. Now, you know you're not going to get out of this place tonight, right? This is where you're going to die. Hearing those words made my heart stop and what felt like ice go through my body. I knew I only had one chance to make it out and I was waiting for that moment. Here it was. I flicked the knife out and jumped towards the man. I then stabbed him in his side beneath his ribs as hard as I could. He fell back and screamed in pain as I twisted it before kicking the man in his leg. He fell to the floor and I ran from the store to my car as fast as I could without falling on the ice that covered our parking lot. I got into my car and started it as fast as I could. I glanced back and saw that the man was trying to get up from the floor and out of the store to catch me. I slammed on my gas and got the hell out of there. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw the man, standing there watching as I sped away. Once I was far enough away, I called the police. Of course, once they got there, the man was gone. There was blood all over the floor behind the counter where he fell after being stabbed. My knife was lying on the floor next to the blood. The police asked me questions, took what they needed, and then had me go to their station to do a sketch of the man. I gave the best description that I could, and then they thanked me and sent me home. About a week later, I got a call from the police who told me they found the man after a person who lived near our store said they'd seen him a few nights later creeping around the back portion of our store where our back door leads out to the garbage bin. They had him in custody. With that, I no longer needed to worry about him. I still work at the store to this day. My co-workers held me as a hero and brave, but I don't feel that way. I've never been so scared in my life. I always kept thinking to myself what reasons could he have to want to come back. I don't know. All I can say is maybe he was coming back to finish the job. Maybe he was coming back for me. I really hope that my story can help someone out there and hopefully be aware of others and to always be safe. I thought that I would share one of the times someone tried to follow me. I'm an 18 year old female, but at the time I believe I was 17. I drive a 2002 Honda Civic. It's had the engine and transmission repaired, so it's been through a lot and at times not the best for speeding up quickly. To better explain this, there's an intersection down the road from my house. Once you start going past the intersection, it bottlenecks into one lane. It was dark at the time and I was on my way to the gym. It took me a good 15 minutes to get to the gym from my house. I was in the right lane, meaning I'd have to merge over into the left. The light turns green and we start going. I put my blinker on like normal and speed up gradually to try and get in. Now before this, I'd seen a Jeep Wrangler. It was purple and had super tinted windows. It was in the left lane right before the light changed. I don't know why, but when I had seen the Jeep, I got a strange feeling. So, merging in, someone behind me in the left lane was being a butthole and tried not to let me in. Lo and behold, it was the Jeep. So, I decided to cut in front of him because at this point, had I not, he would have ran me off the road. So, he flashed his brights and I flipped him off. I mean, seriously, 
it's really not that big of a deal to let someone in front of you anyway. Not a couple of seconds after, I then got the gut feeling he was following me. In situations like this, I freak out immediately. Something I've been trying to work on, but as a 17-year-old 5 foot nothing female driving alone at night on a back road, it's pretty scary. Anyway, so I take out my phone and I call the police, and by this time I'm crying and shaking because I don't know what the person in the Jeep wants. They aren't tailgating me, but they're making every turn that I make now, and my instinct told me they were following me. So I'm on the phone telling the operator what my car looks like and what's going on, all while crying and trying to remain calm. Now, this is where I royally messed up. I shouldn't have done this, but I wasn't thinking, and I've learned from this mistake. Please, don't ever do what I did in this moment. I turned into a dark neighborhood without any streetlights, and the jeep followed me. I pulled off behind a car and watched as the jeep sat in the middle of the road, before they then turned into a driveway and then backed out, leaving the neighborhood. Shortly after, a cop pulled up behind me, and my dad arrived. Now, I know this story wasn't the most scary thing, but to me it still is. Learn from my mistake, and please don't do what I did. Go somewhere public. Call the police as soon as you get the feeling something is weird. It may just save your life one day. For as long as I can remember, I've been pretty interested in the paranormal. I have one instance that has always boggled my mind, and I thought this was the perfect place to share my story. Around the time this story took place, I was in 8th grade, and my sister was in 6th grade. My sister, parents, and I were living with my grandparents, my dad's parents. My grandma had told my sister and I that when my dad was young, this house was haunted. She said she would hear footsteps walk down the hallway and stop in front of her room. Even my dad remembered and said he would see a strange figure in his room. My grandma claimed that once her dad died, the activity stopped. So I'm not sure if this has anything to do with what my sister and I experienced. Anyways, my cousin was visiting at my grandma's house and she was telling my sister and I the story of La Llorona. The weeping woman who lost her kids and now cries and looks for them, or something close to that. We heard this story many times, so this was nothing new. A little later, my cousin went home and everyone went to bed. It was the weekend, so we didn't have to get up early for anything, so no alarms were set. But around 7 in the morning, I heard the loudest cry slash scream I have ever heard in my life. I'm a light sleeper, so it was no surprise that I woke up, but I was shocked when my sister shot up at the same time as me and turned on the light and looked at me. She's a very deep sleeper and could sleep through anything. I pulled the blanket off of me because I thought maybe my dog was hurt. He was fine. My sister and I then looked at each other and asked each other, Did you hear that? We were both freaked out and went to ask if anyone else heard it. Everyone was still asleep. Mind you, this house wasn't that big. It only has three rooms and they were all very close to each other. The scream was so loud, there was no way no one else heard it. My sister and I both agreed that the scream sounded like it was in our heads, and we also agreed that we'd never heard anything like that before. It's been around 10 years since this happened, and we sometimes bring it up from time to time, and the story remains the same. I can still to this day clearly hear it, and it gives me the chills. I would love an explanation. I know this isn't that scary of a story, but to me and my sister, this experience is very strange. Especially because we've never found an explanation and we know this wasn't just a normal scream. We sometimes wonder if the story my cousin told us about La Llorona had anything to do with the scream we heard. I guess we'll never really know though. I'm a 32 year old female and this is something that happened to me only two nights ago. My husband Kevin and I were on the porch smoking a cigarette. It was about 9 o'clock at night. We live far out in the woods right off of a stretch of highway that's between two interstate exits. 
where we're looking up at the star's end enjoying the quiet atmosphere of the crickets, glad to have a temporary relief from all of the usual traffic noise. I heard something and shushed my husband, even though he hadn't said anything. Was that screaming? I thought to myself. Yes, it was a woman screaming like nothing I had ever heard before. It sounded like she was getting murdered. In between blood-chilling screams, she was screaming out, help me, over and over. I look at my husband and we're both really freaked out. The more she screamed, the closer she was getting to the house. I could eventually see a figure running along the median of the highway making their way closer to the part of the highway that was in front of our house. Our house is a good ways back from our driveway, but not far enough that you can't see anything. If we could see her, that meant she could see us. I'd also like to add that we have no yard security lights. Stupid, I know. So, we were in complete darkness. We could still see the highway perfectly fine due to the house across from us who still had their Christmas lights up. I threw my cigarette in my yard and back up to stand in the doorway of the house, pulling out my phone to call 911. She's still in the median of the road, screaming. If anyone else in the surrounding houses heard her, they pretended like they didn't. Kevin runs past me inside to get on his jacket and shoes. I tell him not to go out there, but he ignores me and gets dressed anyway. As soon as he's out of sight, I see a red car barrel up the road and pull over next to where the lady was at. With her in the median, there was still a stretch of highway between them. There was a man driving, but I couldn't see what he looked like. I only heard his voice. He was yelling that he was going to kill her and calling her some bad names. It looked like he was throwing stuff at her out of the window. Maybe clothes? I'm not sure. As soon as she sees him pull over, she starts running straight towards our yard. By that time, I was already on the phone with the police officers, but as I said, I live out in the woods, pretty far out of town, I'll add, so it would take them a bit to get there. I yell for my husband. I tell my nine-year-old son to go in our room where the baby is and close the door. He can hear the whole thing and was pretty frightened. My husband runs out into the porch and into the yard towards her. He asks if she's okay and she then says that she had gotten a ride home from this guy and halfway down the road he started acting really creepy. He refused to let her out where she told him to and kept driving with her in the car. She looked behind her seat pretending to look at a car behind them and saw a roll of duct tape in the back seat. Fearing for her life, she jumped out of the moving car and just started running down the road screaming for help. Kevin starts to lead her towards the house and by now is also on the phone calling the police, having gathered more information that I wasn't able to give them when I had called. They told him to stay on the line with them until an officer showed up. We let her in the house and her face looks terrible. Her face is red and she's bleeding in a couple of spots, road rash from where she had jumped out. She also said that he had hit her before she was able to escape. She came in the house and we locked our door, knob, deadbolt, and chain. We stood together near the windows waiting for the police to show up. Kevin giving updates and answering questions on the phone. No, they haven't gotten here yet. Yes, his car is still parked across the highway. It's a red sedan in front of a house with a lot of blue porch Christmas lights. He told them. I was trying not to lose my crap when there was a loud bang on our door. The man was yelling. I know you're in there. I saw you running. The people in there can't protect you. No one can. I shouted through the door that he needed to leave our property, and if he was smart, he'd get in his car and drive off. I told him we were on the phone with the police. The answer he gave us was the worst one I could ever hear. He says, Go ahead, call the police. I don't care. They won't be here in time. After that, we got several loud bangs on the door, over and over. The woman was freaking out and crying and saying help me, over and over. I ran to the kitchen to get a large knife, just in case. We had a huge solid iron door, but our windows were easily breakable. If he wanted to get in badly enough, he certainly could. My husband just came from our bedroom with his gun when a squad car pulled up in the yard. Two more following behind it and one across the street where his car was. He took off on foot running. They tended to the woman and got her home safely. 
As it turns out, she lives across the highway from us five houses to the left. It had been two hours later and they still hadn't found him. There's a lot of places for him to hide in these woods, so he really could have been anywhere. I just really hope and pray that he hides far away from here, and hopefully we never see him ever again. First off, I just want everyone to know that I'm a guy, and yes, guys too can be victims of sexual harassment. This took place about two or three years ago, and I was probably either 25 or 26 years of age. I work in a factory that makes car parts for Nissan, Honda, Volkswagen, and Toyota. The factory is split up into three departments, Plant 1, Plant 1.5, and, and Plant 2. At the time, I was in Plant 1.5 where everything was going good for me. I was a part of one of the best teams of workers ever. Everyone was great except for this one person. We'll call her Terry, and let's just say she was quite a character. When her and I met, everything was fine. We were talking and she even complimented me on how cute I was. Later on, one of my friends began to notice that she was a little weird. For instance, talking to herself and to inanimate objects and laughing for no reason. At times, she would even walk by me at my machine and grab my waist before walking away. Well, one day on a Friday, I came to work for a little overtime as always. I was on my machine working until I felt something rubbing my shoulders. As I turned around to see what it was, you guessed it, Terry. She then tells me that she thinks I'm sexy and that she likes me. Me, however, was extremely caught off guard and a little shocked to hear that. All I can say in reply is, um, thank you, while confused. I've always found it weird to be called sexy, but it's whatever. Afterwards, I go to my friends Corey and Eric and tell them what just happened. Corey tells me about how strange she is and how she talks to inanimate objects and all that. Later on that day, as I'm back on my machine, it goes down for a little bit, so my work partner goes into the machine to check it out. As I'm back at the work table, she returns and begins asking me if I have a girlfriend, and I replied with no. She asked me why not, and I reply with my famous answer. I just haven't found the right girl, I guess. As this conversation is going on, out of nowhere she throws her hands up like she's getting ready to strangle me, but she stops herself and says that she just wants to touch me. Shocked yet again, all I can respond to that is a simple okay. After that, I began to become very uncomfortable around this woman. Some people began to find it funny, but I learned that I didn't find it funny at all. It's cute if someone has a crush, but she was coming at me way too strong. Plus, most of the time she was constantly having to ask for my name. Corey began to make me feel better as we started making jokes about the whole incident as if it was a horror movie. We talked about how I would go to my truck and she would be there saying stuff like, If I can't have you, nobody can. We had a good laugh about it. Afterwards, everything was starting to look up for as the machine was running good parts and there was a lot of helping hands as well. Everything was fine until Terry returned as she was preparing to leave, asking for my phone number. As much as I wanted to say no and my friends were mouthing the words no, I easily gave in. I don't know why, but all of my life it's been hard for me to say no to people. She wrote the number on her hand of all places, plus she asked for my name yet again. After she had left, I told some of my supervisors about this incident. Eventually work ended and I could finally go home and enjoy somewhat of a weekend. I told my dad and stepfather of the incident, but instead of feeling bad for me, they were proud of me of course. Luckily I never got called by her. She probably forgot my phone number because God knows she couldn't even remember my name. Sunday arrived and I was back to work while feeling a bit paranoid. As I was getting everything ready for my machine and start running, here she comes in tears and telling me to hug her. I reluctantly did. Her face was red and puffy for some strange reason. She began telling me about a bunch of problems that I can't really remember. Then she asked for a couple of quarters for a bottled water as I gladly gave her the money. Whatever it took to get her away from me as quickly as possible. 
Later on, I decided to tell my supervisor about the incident from Friday, due to him being absent that night it took place. I had to write a complaint about what happened, basically everything I just told him from earlier. Afterwards, as the day went on, my supervisor came back to tell me that he attempted to confront her about the incident. He told me that she went on saying that the feds had her cell phone. He also told me that she was clearly crazy. I agreed. Finally, it all came to an end when I had found out that she had been fired for going into the bathroom with a straw. All I know is that she wasn't going in there to sip the toilet water, so it had to have been for drug use. I was relieved that it was all over now. Terry, let's not meet again. By the way, I really hope you got help because God knows you needed it. My name is Jesse and I'm 28 and this is my real life experience with a demon. This happened when I was around 6 to 8 years old and to this day I can remember it vividly. It was very late one night, probably around 3 a.m., and everyone was asleep. My family lived together in a trailer at the time. My parents slept on one end and I slept on the other. I woke up one late night because I had to use the restroom. It was pitch black in the trailer and I was too short to reach the light switch in the bathroom. When I stepped into the doorway of the bathroom, I stared into the darkness and I saw two blood red glowing eyes staring back at me. I just stared back in frozen terror, unable to move or scream, and then I saw what looked like silver fangs appear below the eyes, followed by a deep rumbling growl, a noise I'll never forget. It was kinda like a wolf's but slightly deeper. It was in the bathroom staring at me like it wanted to devour me. I remember that I was so scared that I just lay on the ground right in front of the doorway and got into the fetal position with my head tucked between my legs. I awoke the next morning in my bed and the first thought that came to my mind was the incident that occurred last night. I wondered how I got back into my bed and why I couldn't remember anything after lying down in the hallway. I went straight to my parents and asked them if they had found me lying in the floor and put me in the bed in the middle of the night. When they both responded no they didn't, I immediately felt a weird feeling going through my body. Over the next few years, everyone in my family noticed my behavior becoming more and more violent, including punching my niece in the face and other unacceptable things for absolutely no reason. In my teens, after doing some research, I came to the only conclusion I could think of, and that the creature in the bathroom may have been a hellhound or a demon marauder from hell, and that it must have entered or possessed me. I decided I wouldn't let it win and take me over and have been making an extreme effort to control my anger ever since. This happened 20 years ago and I've maybe told 5 people this story. I promise it was real and I still remember the whole thing to this day. I'd like to hear other people's ideas of what may have happened but I know for a fact that it wasn't a dream. This just happened to me last Wednesday night. A couple of friends and I had just gone to a late night showing of the movie Dunkirk and had hopped on the subway on our way home. The three of us were sitting towards the back of the train talking about the movie and our plans for the weekend when an older overweight black guy in the seat across the train from us started to snore very heavily. We couldn't stop cracking up at the over the top sounds he was making and moved further up the train where we could still see him but no longer hear him as clearly. About four stops later, there were only about six of us left in the train car. My friend and I, the sleeping man, and a couple other people on the opposite end. Our stop was coming up next and I was on my feet holding to the handrails while my friends were still sitting. I happened to glance back over towards the older man and I noticed he was awake, or at least one eye was open, the right one and he appeared to be staring straight ahead. Not necessarily at me, but in our direction. The train hit a bump and the train shattered, and the man opened his other eye, yawned, and reached his hand up to his right eye. My mouth fell open when he pulled the eye directly from his eye socket, revealing it to be made of glass. My friend saw the look on my face and then glanced over. One of them hissed, really, right here on the subway? The glass eye was weird enough, but what happened next nearly made me vomit and run screaming down the train car. 
The old man poked his finger around in the empty eye socket for a full 10 seconds before pulling something out. Now granted, I was maybe two car lengths away from this guy, but here's what I think I saw. A small white wriggling insect, maybe a maggot, flailing around between the guy's forefinger and thumb. Before I could even process that fully, the man popped it right into his mouth. Both of my friends leaped to their feet, one exclaiming, Oh hell no! And we walked further down the train as far as we could, and when our next stop came, we quickly stepped off and power walked out of the station. I don't even remember the rest of the walk home. I was in such a daze rewinding that in my head over and over again, trying to convince myself that it wasn't what it had seemed to be. After a few days of retrospect, I suppose the whole thing could have been a prank, like some kind of hidden camera gag, and maybe the maggot had really been a grain of rice or something, but it seemed like an odd thing to do on nearly an empty train that late at night. It's not like the man had started coughing heavily or drew any attention towards himself before he did it to be sure we were watching. I've been scouring YouTube looking for gag videos, half hoping to find it to put my mind at ease, but so far nothing. Maybe it's still too soon. I want to find it so I can finally relax and reassure myself that it wasn't what it seemed to be. An old man picking insects out of his head to eat, but whether it's a prank or not, one thing is for dang sure. Old man on the train with a glass eye. Let's never meet again. Back in mid-December of 2013, about a week before Christmas, I was enjoying my first bourbon and coke and reclining on my buddy's dusty outdoor couch in Naples, Florida. It was about 10 o'clock at night and his party was in full swing, with people drunkenly leaping into his pool, playing foosball in the garage, and loudly arguing over some video game. The guy-to-gal ratio was off by a wide margin. There were maybe only six college girls in attendance and more than 20 guys, which was souring my mood. But overall, I was happy for the opportunity to drink without having to worry about driving anywhere the following day. There was a full moon that night, and a few guys were outside tossing aluminum cans into the bonfire and playing fetch with my friend's dogs using a broken broom handle. I rolled off the couch to refill my drink when my friend Scott grabbed my arm and told me I had to come and see this new chick that had just arrived. I walked inside to the living room to discover a gorgeous 10 out of 10 busty redhead sitting on the coffee table wearing a black leather corset and fishnet stockings. She had full sleeve tattoos on each arm and wore a black choker around her neck with many spikes protruding from it. Convinced someone had brought a prostitute to the party, I decided to distance myself from her in case the cops arrived, but Scott grabbed my arm again and said, Hold up man, you've got to check this out. Mark brought her, and he says she's a vampire. I rolled my eyes and immediately lost interest in the situation and tried to leave again, just wanting to refill my drink and head back out to the couch by the pool where I could enjoy the view of two of the six college girls in their swimsuits. Scott refused to let me go, however, and he made me watch as a small crowd gathered around the redhead and started shouting out questions. She said her name was Shade and she'd been a vampire for 12 years, and even though she looked like she was in her mid-twenties, she was closer to 40. One guy asked to see her fangs and she bore her teeth menacingly. I was shocked to see she had extremely long, pointed canine teeth. The group clapped and cheered and even though I was convinced they were probably fakes, I clapped as well. She was giving the performance her all, I had to admit and with every question about daylight and drinking blood that was thrown at her, she answered boldly without hesitation, like she had answered these questions dozens of times before. I decided to try something daring, ready to prove that this was just some chick who had a vampire fetish. In my back pocket was a sterling silver St. Christopher keychain. I slipped the ring part over my finger and made to approach her, like I was going to shake her hand. I didn't think she would mind as she had a guy on either arm at that point, but once I was within five feet of her, she snapped at me to back the heck up and pointed a finger right at the hand with the keychain. My blood immediately went cold. That had either been an incredibly lucky coincidence or something seriously messed up was going on. Some of the surrounding people laughed, but most of the crowd booed me and yelled for me to get out, so I shambled back outside by the pool and flopped myself down on the couch too shaken to even consider getting a refill on my drink. 
After about a half hour or so, I noticed Shade come outside, followed by about seven or eight guys. I raised an eyebrow, half hoping she was about to get naked and jump in the pool, but she walked right past it and out to the bonfire. And no joke, the dog started barking at her like crazy. As I sat up on the couch to get a better look, Scott came over to me and sat down beside me. Dude, she has a flask of rat's blood. She was throwing it back like water in there. I shrugged and commented that it was likely tomato juice, but Scott insisted it had been real blood, as the flask had been passed around and people had smelled the bloody residue on the flask's mouth. I was about to say something else sarcastic when the crowd around the bonfire started screaming. Not in excitement, but in terror. I heard a high-pitched wail of pain and I shot to my feet. Shade was kneeling upon the ground biting into some random guy's leg. One of the guys next to Shade brought his beer bottle down and smashed it against her head, but she didn't release her grip. Jacob, the guy who owned the house, screamed at her and punched her in the side of the head, but she continued to hold tight. That was the point where most of the crowd started to take off running in terror. A handful of guys stayed behind and tried to pry Shade away from him, but after another few minutes she released him on her own, screamed like a banshee, her mouth covered in blood, and took off running into the shadows. Four guys had tried to pull the poor guy away from her, and her knees hadn't even buckled. The guy collapsed on the ground, screaming in pain, a long strip of denim torn away from his jeans. I stood there in shock and terror trying to process what I had just seen, refusing to believe it. The police and ambulance showed up maybe 15 minutes later. Jacob tried to get Mark arrested for bringing that psycho chick to his party, but after the cops questioned him about her, they let him leave. Jacob was the one who ended up being arrested as several of the party goers had been underage. I've never seen or heard anything about Shade since. A few of us got together every night for about a week and scoured the internet looking for her virtual footprint, but we couldn't find anything. I don't think she was actually a vampire, obviously, but the fact is she tore the flesh off of some guy's leg with her teeth, and she was strong enough to hold on as she was attacked by guys much bigger than her. I tell this story to my friends and family every Halloween. Sometimes Scott is there and he backs me up. Sometimes they ask me what I'll do if I ever see Shade again. I always answer the same thing. She won't come near me. I carry the St. Christopher keychain everywhere. In February of 2003, I was renting a room in a high-rise building in Daegu, South Korea. I was awoken just after 10 a.m. by the wailing of sirens and peeked out my window to see smoke billowing from the entrance to the Jungangno station. It wasn't a small amount of smoke either, like someone had lit the contents of a trash can on fire, but a solid wall of smoke escaping from the underground chamber so thick as if it was a volcano had erupted. After watching the street below turn into a parking lot of emergency vehicles, the alarm in my buildings went off, ordering us to evacuate. I exited the building but had no idea where to go. The smoke was incredibly thick and every direction was packed with people trying to get away on foot. I ducked back into the building and crouched in the entryway, keeping my face low to the ground and breathing the fresh air being pumped through the air conditioning vents. I stayed there for a good few hours, unwilling to venture out into the street and risk being trampled or suffocated, yet too afraid to move deeper into the building in case it caught fire. I had no idea what was going on and suspected a bomb had gone off. Without access to a phone, all I could do was wait, a thousand questions flying through my head and hoping the nightmare would end. The smoke eventually cleared but when it did, the screaming only intensified. I wandered out into the street in a daze, firefighters with oxygen masks on frantically gesturing at each other, trying to direct traffic well enough to make a path for ambulances. I felt like I had been lost at sea for several hours, isolated and terrified I was going to die, and now I had washed up upon the shores of Pompeii directly after the eruption, and I just knew I'd never look at my life the same way again. It wasn't until nearly a week later I had learned the full story. A 56-year-old unemployed man named Kim Dae-han had boarded the subway train at Daegu Station earlier that morning with the intent to set the train on fire and burn the passengers alive. Han suffered from depression and, as a result of a stroke in 2001, had been left partly paralyzed. 
He later told police he wished to kill himself, but in a manner where he could take hundreds with him so his pain would be remembered. He was spotted on camera carrying a duffel bag onto the train, which contained cartons of flammable liquid, likely paint thinner or gasoline. Once the train was in motion, he opened the bag and began pouring the liquid out. When other passengers saw him fiddling with his lighter, they rushed him in an attempt to stop him, but they ultimately failed. Fire erupted in the train car and when the doors opened in the next station, Han and several other passengers managed to escape, some with burning clothing, but once the train stopped, the fire quickly began to spread across all six cars, mostly due to the flammable insulation lining the car walls in between the aluminum shell and the interior. There was so much smoke down on the platform, none of the cameras could see exactly what was happening. Another train heading in the opposite direction towards the same platform was warned to proceed with caution, but not instructed to stop. Upon arriving at Jingdongno Station, the train stopped right next to the burning subway cars. The conductor not sure what to do. He didn't open the doors to prevent the smoke from entering the train. The power failed on the station after a minute, preventing the train from leaving, and while the conductor frantically tried to call for help over his radio, he eventually panicked and abandoned the train leaving the passengers trapped inside. There were no fire extinguishers on board the trains and no fire sprinklers on the subway platforms, and the smoke was too thick for emergency responders to reach the trains for several hours. It was still early morning rush hour. Over 190 people, men, women, and children, all died trapped beneath the streets. Kim Dae-han was eventually found later in the hospital where he was being treated for his burns. On August 5, 2003, he was sentenced to life in prison, where he died just over a year later on August 31, 2004. The conductor of the second train was arrested for criminal negligence, as were six other members of the Metropolitan Subway Corporation. So yeah, that's my story of how I was practically on top of one of the worst mass murders in history, where the man intending to kill himself with all his victims ran as soon as the train doors opened. I left the city soon after and have since tried to cherish every single day as another gift abundant with new possibilities. I'm truly grateful for every day that I get to wake up and be alive. I can't say the same for the victims. May they all rest in peace. This story is about a sick and twisted man that I'd met online when I was 18 and ended up dating. He was jealous, controlling, abusive in every possible way, and was filled with sadistic tendencies and rage. His name was Oscar. I had tried to leave Oscar many, many times. I wasn't happy. In fact, I was in a constant state of panic and was absolutely miserable in the relationship that had lasted just a year. Each attempt to leave him was met with threats to hurt me and my family, physically dragging me back, sexually assaulting and purposely trying to impregnate me, threatening to commit suicide or constant stalking and harassment until I surrendered. Finally I had enough and decided I wasn't going back no matter what he did. He called my job non-stop and got me in major trouble, and did the same at my house, prompting me to unplug the phone line. He texted me to say that he promised he was going to kill himself if I didn't go back to him. Instead of caving though, I called his mom at work and told her. She got a hold of him and said I must have misunderstood because he was clearly fine. I felt I had done all that I could do and I told him I'd call the police the next time he said something like that to have them go check on him. The next day I got a call on myself from Oscar. I rejected it. He called again and I yet again rejected it. Then I heard the loud exhaust on his car outside while I looked down at my phone and saw him calling again. I let it go to my voicemail while I peeked through the blinds to check if I had truly heard his car, as I'd started to falsely hear it sometimes out of paranoia, but this time he was indeed out in front of my house. My phone started ringing again and I wanted him to stop. I answered it. He told me to come outside. I don't want to see you, I said. Just come outside for a few minutes, please, Oscar said, making a huge effort to sound pleasant. I told you to stop calling me and you show up at my house? Why can't you respect my wishes? I asked, knowing the question wouldn't be addressed. 
I just felt bad about how everything went down, and I wanted to give you something I made for you before you broke up with me. Just come outside for a few minutes so I can apologize, then I'll go away and you'll never hear from me ever again. Oscar pleaded. I don't know. I don't trust you. I told him, looking at him sitting in his car through the living room window. I promise. He said, kind of convincingly. I drove all the way here to give you what I made, and just have a proper goodbye. In hindsight, I should have called BS on all of that immediately, but I was young and still way too controlled by my need to not hurt other people's feelings. I felt bad that he'd driven the 40 minutes to my house with something he made for me for me to just refuse to come out. Ugh, fine, only a few minutes, I stated firmly. And you promise you're not going to try to beg me back? He promised and I went outside. I opened the passenger side door and sat down in the seat, leaving the door wide open. He commented that I must think he's going to kidnap me, trying to pass it off like a joke. I told him I just wanted the extra leg room. He had a bouquet of flowers and some cases of DVDs that he'd burned for me for all of the seasons of my favorite TV show. We talked for a minute, when my cell phone rang. I shouldn't have picked it up knowing it was a guy for my job, but I was an idiot. I answered it and talked to the guy for less than 30 seconds. Oscar could hear it was a man's voice. I could instantly tell when I saw his head snap to attention in my peripheral vision. When I hung up, Oscar looked at me with fury in his eyes, and he asked me some questions about the caller that I can't even recall now. Before I could reply to whatever he asked, he had slammed on the accelerator and was flying down the street with my door still open. I instinctively pulled my legs into the vehicle and started screaming for him to stop. He didn't seem to even be hearing me. I tried to jump out when he started to slow down at intersections, and seeing this, he grabbed my clothes with his hand to hold me in and started making sharp left turns through the neighborhood to force my door to swing shut. Once that was accomplished, I tried to open the door again, and he kept hitting the automatic locks to stop me, and was consistently increasing his speed to ensure any leap from the car would be dangerous. By now it was dark outside. He was speeding through my town double the speed limit. I was hoping a police officer would see this and start telling him and pull him over, but apparently he'd gone unseen. He reached the freeway and I started really panicking. He would be able to go even faster here and fast track me wherever he planned to take me. It took maybe three minutes to get to the freeway at the speed he was going, all of which I spent trying to get out of the vehicle. Once he was on the freeway, he was going over 100 miles per hour. I kept looking at the speedometer. It was dark outside, and that was much too fast to jump from a moving car on the freeway, with other cars driving at high speeds and unable to see me. I still had my phone, so I tried to dial 911. I pressed the numbers with my hand shoved down the side of the seat by my window, away from Oscar. But he saw what I was doing and started swerving all over the road while trying to grab my phone from me. I still don't really know how he managed to get it away from me because every ounce of my being was trying to hold on. He took it, rolled down his window, and threw it out. Rolling his window back up, he flatly stated, If I can't have you, then no one will. That sentence made my heart sink. I felt like I was in a Lifetime movie. Oscar was possessed by his need to possess me, and I was trapped. This is when the grim reality started to really set in. He was out of control and I was out of options. I started screaming for help and pounding on the windows, but Oscar had the tint on those windows so dark that I probably wouldn't have even been seen if it wasn't dark outside. I watched as the people in each car we passed remained blissfully unaware of the chaos going on in the car I was being kidnapped in. I was feeling very defeated but was running through all the possibilities of how this could go, over and over in my mind, trying to figure out how to survive. I decided to stop fighting and acting afraid because the only way I saw myself making out of this alive was by feeding into Oscar's delusional state. I had no other weapons or means of escape at my disposal, so I decided on psychological warfare. Oscar had this friend named Jose that he'd gotten exceedingly close to over the course of our relationship. After a time, it was revealed to me in confidence that Jose had fled from Puerto Rico, supposedly on the run for murder. I saw that Oscar was taking the necessary freeway interchanges to get to Jose's place, and knew that even if his friend hadn't really been wanted for murder, he was the type of guy who would do anything for Oscar without moral restriction. 
Jose and I got along okay, but I knew he'd have no loyalty to me whatsoever. He was nice to me as long as I was an extension of Oscar. I had to act quickly. I proceeded to tell Oscar that I loved him and I wished we could be together, but that I didn't see how it could ever work when things like what he was doing right now proved that he never cared about what I wanted. I hadn't necessarily cited that as a reason for wanting out of the relationship before, as it was much more complex than that, but I was hoping it was enough to offer him hope in his state of desperation. I told him I had been considering giving him another chance when I saw the flowers and DVDs, but now that he was refusing to take me home when I asked him to, I started to second guess things. Oscar got off the freeway on Jose's exit, and I started trying to formulate a plan for when the car stopped. I knew Jose had neighbors close by, and I decided I was going to run as fast as I could and scream at the top of my lungs. I was trying to keep Oscar's mind preoccupied in the meantime though, so that he wouldn't think to call Jose and give him a heads up. They usually spoke to each other in Spanish, so I would have no idea what was even said. Oscar told me that he did care about what I wanted, and he asked if he still had a chance with me if he turned around right now. In an effort not to expose myself with an overly enthusiastic reply, I hesitated a bit and said that I thought we could probably work it out and this would be a good place to start. Oscar looped around and got back on the freeway headed in the opposite direction, back towards my house. The rest of the ride was tense because Oscar was normally so perceptive and I didn't want to reveal myself and end up back in the line of fire. I can't recall what was said on the commute back, but I opted to talk about regular everyday things I normally say to him in casual conversation. When we got back to my house and he let me open my door and didn't stop me from leaving, I could finally breathe. I got out, taking the flowers and DVDs with me, and waved him before walking into my house. I walked straight to the garbage bin and threw it all in the trash, and then collapsed on my couch, shaking violently, but ultimately so grateful to have made it home. The next day, I went to the police station and filed a restraining order against him. Within a few years, he would be jailed for other appalling crimes and sentenced to 60 years. Until I found that out, I never truly felt safe. He's definitely where he belongs. So to that psychopath Oscar that likely was going to kill me, I really hope I never see you for the rest of my life. This may well be the worst way to tell your parents you're gay. I do not recommend. My sophomore year of high school, I was on the cast and costume crew for our fall play. One of my castmates slash crewmates was a really, really cute guy. His name was Mark. He always wore skinny jeans, who I learned from a mutual friend was bisexual. So I started flirting with him, looking for opportunities to hang out, sending him memes, basically everything a closeted nerd could do. After about three months of flirting, hanging out, and growing gradually more affectionate, I asked him out on the last day of our play. He said yes. Well, the issue... My mother is a very conservative Christian, and although she was tolerant of gay people, I knew she'd never allow me to have a boyfriend while I lived with her. So, we had to hide our relationship, which early on wasn't too bad. We'd go to the movies or his house and just hang out. But everything started going downhill the first time we had sex. He started getting really demanding about hanging out, and by demanding about hanging out, I mean he was never not horny and frustrated. I was cool with it at first cause, well, sex, but after a while I was getting pissed about it. Working a relationship around my mom was difficult, and my generally asocial nature was not at all enjoying having to leave the house so often. I tried to talk to Mark about it and he seemed understanding for like a week. Then he started getting nasty. He'd avoid me at school only to text me to insult me and act insanely jealous of my friends. Eventually I had enough and I dumped him in July after 9 months over text while I was in Florida. Look, I was 16, don't judge me. Anyway, he lost it. He blew up my phone daily for about a week, then he started acting normal like we were friends. That lasted another month and we got back to school. Unfortunately, while we were dating we had tried to coordinate our schedules, so now we had 4 out of 7 classes with each other. At first he seemed okay. Then he started staring at me. Then he started texting me again with sad messages. I figured he was done being mean to me and I started being nice to him again. Big mistake. 
he started getting attached again. He would try to integrate himself every time I went out with my friends. He would beg me to take him back. I would say no and explain again why we couldn't be together. Around October, he started getting bad, like 1am texts about swallowing a whole bottle of melatonin bad. In hindsight, I should have gone to the authorities, but I was terrified that doing so would lead to my mom finding out. So I tried to handle it myself. Bad idea. He got worse. He threatened to kill himself regularly and tried to turn my friends against me. The worst day thus far came when we were building our homecoming float for drama club. I was hanging out and casually flirt bantering with two of my male friends, Isaac and Caleb, who are both straight. Mark saw this, stood up from where he'd been painting, and walked out in a hurry. A few minutes later, a freshman girl walked in asking me where Mark was going. He said that I'd know. I found out later he'd driven himself to the ER to get counseling. I was happy, thinking he'd get some help but I had no damn clue how obsessed he was. I came home from rehearsal one day to find his car parked up my street and Mark walking towards it from my house. My mom was on the porch waving bye to him. Apparently he'd been in the neighborhood and thought to drop by. Just for some background, I am the eldest of seven boys. My youngest brothers were two years old and six months in the womb during this. My mom raised us primarily by herself. Dad's a dirtbag, stepdad was deployed through his ordeal. She is an honest six feet tall, about half that wide, and can easily sling me across her shoulders. I'm six foot three and 180 pounds. She is also the best shot with a pistol I've ever seen by far. Not someone Mark, who's 5'4", 120 pounds soaking wet, would want to tangle with, even while she was heavily pregnant. I told her we did hang out, just not as much. She accepted this and we went about our days. For a week, everything was okay, and then I came home from rehearsal. Mark's car was parked up the street again and he was sitting on our porch with my mother who had my baby brother on her lap. She saw me get out of the car and gave me a come hither crook of the finger. Slowly, I walked up to the porch. It turned out Mark had told her everything, everything, our whole relationship but with me as the abuser and himself as the victim. She started to lay into me, then dismissed Mark, who went back to his car snickering. After she was done ranting, I calmly told her my side of the story. Fortunately, she believed me, but she was still pissed, so I was grounded, which pales in comparison to what happened that night. Our house is old and crappy. The windows can easily be jiggled open from the outside, even when they're locked. Mark knew this since I used it to my advantage many times when sneaking out. And my mom's room where she and my two-year-old brother slept is right across the hall from mine, facing the backyard. Mine faces the street. That night, I woke up around 2 a.m. because I was cold. After I got my glasses on, I saw why. My window was open. I whipped around searching for whoever did it. My bedroom door was open as well. As I got up, I heard the sound of my mom's bedroom door quietly closing. I raced as quietly as possible to the door, and then I heard something that stopped my heart. A metallic click, like a gun being cocked. I flew across the hall and threw my mom's door open. The lights were on. Mark was crouched in the corner, a cleaver in hand. My brother was sound asleep. And my mom, you ask? Well, my mom was calmly sitting on the bed, glasses on, Harry Potter book in her lap, 10 millimeter pistol in her hands pointed directly at Mark, who was shaking and sobbing. She told him to shut up before he woke the baby and directed me to call the cops so she could keep an eye on him. Mark was taken into custody, but my mom declined to press charges on the condition that Mark move out to Arizona with his dad instead of staying in Missouri with his mom, which he did. From that point on, I hardly saw him unless he was Snapchatting my friends begging to talk to me. His typical standard crap. Mark, for your safety, I really hope me or my family never have to see you ever again. When I was 23 years old, I was renting my first place when my ex-girlfriend reached out to me. We dated for X- We dated for X amount of months in high school. It's been over 10 years since high school and I can't remember how long it was. It just went badly because I was kind of a douchebag and started talking to another girl. 
Anyway, my ex said she was over what happened when we were teenagers and was willing to give it another shot. So we have a date and then several dates and things are doing really well. A month into our relationship, one night I'm at work on a late shift and she calls me saying she had gotten into an argument with her mother. They had gotten into some sort of domestic dispute about something and she got slapped and she needed to cool off at my place. I get home and turns out she was moving in. I'm pretty laid back and I wanted help with the rent anyways, so I'm somewhat okay with it. I mean, I knew I was walking into a snake pit, but I had no idea it was going to be a viper pit. So we live together for a whopping two months when things take a turn. She starts telling me she's insecure about me talking to other girls and then that changes to watching porn as well, which didn't work because I have control issues. We start fighting a lot, sometimes all night long. She starts cutting herself and saying it was all my fault and ends up getting a tetanus. I start constantly getting late phone calls asking where I am at work and who I'm with. I work late hours at an ambulance service. Things come to a head one night when Crazy X tries to tell me looking at porn is the same thing as beating her. She starts screaming at me and bringing up all the cutting and doctor visits claiming it's all my fault. I get fed up and tell her to move out. This pushes her off the deep end. She grabs my gun that I keep for self-defense and tells me that she's going to kill herself. I call the police and she leaves shortly afterwards after she throws my loaded handgun outside. I think to myself, yay, it's finally over, but it wasn't yet. So a few days go by without incident. Crazy X texts me saying she needs to give me her house key. I tell her no and to just throw it away, but no. She drives to my house anyway, leaves the key, and tapes a note to my door saying I'm mentally ill and I need help, and all this crap about how she forgives me and blah blah blah. I stopped reading it after the I need help part, and she kept texting me and asking if I read it, even going as far as blaming her behavior on her pregnancy, saying that the baby is mine but she lost it due to stress. So here I am years down the road now married with a wonderful two year old hellion with no regrets of leaving the crazy ex. I hope wherever she is my crazy ex is doing okay, but I really never want to see her again. My mom was traveling for work and sat next to a man on the plane. They had a casual conversation and exchanged business cards. Later that evening she's in her hotel watching TV and gets a phone call from the front desk that her husband is here and they want to know if they can give him a key to the room. Turns out the creep on the plane was pretending to be her husband and trying to get into her room. I was traveling out of the country right after finishing up a huge five day work event where I had about 10 hours of sleep total during the five days. I got to the motel which is kind of run down and the carpet and blankets are damp but I'm so exhausted I don't even really think about it. I fall asleep pretty much immediately at like 8 p.m. local time. At maybe 11 p.m. or so, I get a call from the motel phone saying there's been a complaint about noise. I tell them that's impossible. I've been sleeping. They ask me if maybe it's someone else in the room, and I tell them nope. I'm here alone, so there's definitely no one else making any noise. They ask me again if I'm sure I'm by myself and not causing any noise. I say yes again and fall back asleep immediately. When I woke up and thought about it some more, I realized how weird the entire interaction was. There was absolutely no noise I could hear anywhere nearby, and I don't know why the motel staff would need me to clarify so many times that I was alone. Apparently they never really called, so I assumed it must have been someone calling the different rooms to see who was in the rooms and how many people. I've never been so glad to always always use the extra latch chain lock. Thank God I did. While in the Isles of Scotland, we stayed in a B&B. It was owned by a couple. The bedrooms were extremely well done and beautiful, but on everything there was signs to not touch. To use the shower you would have to ask the couple, and the internet ended at 11pm. The woman would also check on everyone at random times in the night. We would hear creeping in the hallway to make sure everyone was sleeping and not doing any illegal things like using the internet. 
When we checked out of her BNB, she came into our room and said that we stunk, and then she opened the window to prove this and demanded for money immediately. Another traveler had to go a check to pay for the room, and she took their bags and wouldn't give them back. But on the way out, she asked everyone if they enjoyed their stay. We found a hotel in Yangon the day we got there for pretty cheap. They mentioned that the rates were low because maintenance was being done on several floors. We sleep fine, wake up, and head to breakfast. At breakfast, we met some Germans who had also stayed the night in our hotel. They said they had not slept well because during the middle of the night, someone woke them up to move them from the floor they were on. We, us and the Germans, found out later that they had been moved because they were on one of the levels reserved for maintenance, and part of the maintenance included gassing the rooms for bugs. During the middle of the night, they were just going around the room, shoving the gas nozzle or whatever under the doors and just letting them run. Well, they wound up killing the two people next to the Germans before they realized they accidentally booked people on that floor. Thankfully, we weren't on that floor, but it's always stuck with me how seemingly easy it could have been to have gotten mixed up in that. So, mine takes place in a London hostel a few weeks ago. I have two friends with me that are both male, and we're staying in a nine-bed mixed dorm. There's three sets of tier bunk beds. I'm in the bottom bed of the right bunk, friend one in the top of my bunk, and friend two in bottom bed of middle bunk. So we get in at 2 a.m. and all just quietly get in our beds. After a few minutes of lying there trying to sleep, I hear rustling behind me. So I think it's just someone going through their bag and I ignore it. Then I feel a hand on my hip over the cover. I turn around and it's a random guy telling me to move over and trying to pull at my cover. I initially thought he was drunk and wasn't sure which bed to be in, so I tell him to go find his own bed and then he shuffles away to the bottom bed of the left bunk. Well, then he comes back again. I again tell him to go back to his own bed and he shuffles back to his own yet again. This happens another couple of times with me gradually speaking louder and getting less polite, telling him to screw off. So I'm shaking because the situation is making me nervous, and I message my mate that's on the top bunk, saying I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep that night. He messages me back, casually thinking it's because of someone snoring. This is when I find out both of my mates have earplugs in, and although they've heard me speaking, they each thought I was speaking to the other friend. So I tell him the situation and he starts keeping an eye out. I hear the guy go to the bathroom that is in suite but I can tell from the light he left the bathroom door open whilst doing so, and refused to look. My mate fills me in that the guy was walking around with his pants down and deliberately left the door open to get me to look, but either way, the guy goes back to his bed afterwards, and we think the situation is finally over. Then it happens again. My mate, keeping an eye out, shines his phone light on the floor and shouts for the guy to screw off. Apparently, he was crawling across the floor towards me, the guy suddenly takes offense at my mate's light shining on him and starts actually climbing the bunk ladder like King Kong to get to my mate on the top and was trying to take his phone. They start to wrestle for a while with my mate actually kicking the guy in the neck and trying to keep him away, only for the guy to swing backwards and come straight back at him yet again. I use this time to run for security who find the guy still hanging on the bed when they get there, then call the police and have the guy taken away in a riot van and banned from the building. Whilst the police had dragged him outside waiting for the riot van, the guy even headbutted the brick wall several times. No idea what the guy was on, but it definitely wasn't alcohol, but definitely on something to take a kick to the neck and still act like nothing happened afterwards. The guy kept trying to blame my mate when security came as well, saying things in broken English like, come up here and see how violent this guy is. My other mate that had slept through the whole incident kept saying the next day that he couldn't believe how friendly everyone in London is. That was before he knew what actually happened. I arrived late at a hotel for a business trip. Flight had a malfunction so we had to land. They fixed it on the tarmac and we never deplaned. Room already paid for, confirmation number in hand, etc. I got there about five hours after I was supposed to be there. Of course, they gave away my room. 
I already wasn't happy from all the delays, and I wasn't going anywhere. The event I was there for was in their hotel. I wanted my room. I was polite but firm. They did some scrambling and asked if I would consider a damaged room under construction. As long as the sheets are clean so I can go to bed, I don't care. That was my reply. Big mistake. The room they gave me was literally a crime scene. The case had been closed so there was no legal issue to contend with, but someone had been killed, or nearly killed. Not 100% sure in that room. They had primed over the blood stains on the walls and ceilings, but had only taped down semi-clear plastic over the pooled blood on the carpets. Multiple small holes in the walls had obviously been patched and sanded, but there were multiple small holes in the walls. They gave me a completely new bed and TV from on-site inventory, so I was comfortable, but man, it was creepy as hell. The creepiest part was the priming job. It was so obviously blood splatter. You could see where the person had been hit and where they fell. You could also see how they had tried to get up and where they had finally collapsed. I'd like to add that this was in 1999. It was a StarTag flip phone. Very stylish back in the day. I usually wore it in a belt holster like Robin Williams in the movie Hook. I didn't call the hotel from the tarmac because I had very bad reception inside the plane. We landed at a small airport in Tennessee. I think it was called Myrna. Something like that. An ugly girl's name is all I remember it as. Cell towers weren't all that common back then particularly away from the metro areas. I didn't call the hotel when we landed because the hotel was in the airport. Dallas, DFW. I wasn't traveling alone. I was on a later flight than a lot of people because I was part of the planning team. Huge meeting with blocks of rooms arranged for and paid for by my team well in advance of the event. I was made aware that there was renovations in progress, but I honestly didn't care. I had to be on stage presenting to large groups about five hours from the time I arrived. I had to get some sleep and have somewhere to shower and use the bathroom. I was given a new room the next day. I hadn't unpacked much and made sure I was 100% repacked before I went down to the meeting rooms. The hotel arranged to bring everything from murder room to non-murder room. I picked up new keys at the front desk. I would have loved to take some pictures but I didn't have my camera. StarTag flip phones didn't have that function. Believe it or not, I'd never even considered the suicide option before someone else here brought it up. Looking back on it now, that may have been the case. I've been telling this story for close to 20 years. I'll raise that possibility from now on. I don't have any witnesses. It's just a very odd and unbelievably true story. And a very creepy one at that. This was pre-Google, pre-Trip Advisor, etc. The internet existed, obviously, but it was stuff like Rotten.com and E-Bombs World. Fun stuff. Not nearly what it is today. We actually had a planner on the team who booked rooms and space for meetings as something like half her job. Like a semi-professional travel agent. The PR angle would be scary today. I can just see the BuzzFeed clickbait generated by 100 iPhone pictures taken from odd angles. But no, that stuff didn't happen back then. I was very grateful that they pulled out a brand new mattress for me. I tipped everyone involved in that operation $10, two maintenance guys and one maid who was not in a maid uniform, some sort of sweatsuit. She made the bed while I brushed my teeth in the bathroom. She was happier with the $10 than the maintenance guys. They were grumpy. Like I said, this is one of the creepiest stories that have ever happened to me, and I plan to tell it for a long time to come. When I was about four years old, my family ended up staying at the Cedar Lodge Motel where Gary Stainer worked right before he murdered four women. My family drove to Yosemite, and it was a long drive for us. By the time we arrived at the motel, it was late. We were all cranky, and we couldn't wait to get out. But at the moment we pulled in, something set my mom's teeth on edge, and she insisted that we left and found another hotel, reservation or not. My mom has always had like this sixth sense and her gut has actually saved us a couple of times. But my dad was tired and he managed to convince her to just ignore her gut and just stay for the night and the next morning we'd leave. 
I can remember my mom actually refusing to let go of our hands, making us stay right by her side as she kept looking around while checking in. To try and get her to relax, my dad suggested we go to the pool, thinking it would calm her down. Well, when we got there, there were no towels, so my mom called the front desk. The moment the man delivering towels arrived, my mom immediately grabbed us out of the water and rushed us back to the room. The man gave her the absolute creeps, and she says there was just this feeling of pure evil when he looked at us. That night, my mom and dad pushed the dresser in front of the door and had us all sleep in the same bed. The next morning, we left to go to another hotel, but my mom couldn't stop talking about how evil that motel was. About two months later, she and my dad were up late watching the news when they started reporting on a man who had murdered a woman and two young girls in Yosemite. Just as my mom began to say, how much you want to bet that it was that motel, they showed Carrie Stainer's face and it occurred at the Cedar Lodge Motel. Carrie Stainer was the man who brought us our towels at the pool. We've never gone back to Yosemite since, and my mom is always insistent that we listen to our gut feeling, and when every bone in your body is telling you something is wrong, get the hell out. My company would put us up in the Shiloh Inn downtown when we were in Salt Lake City. A coworker of mine was awakened in the middle of the night by the sounds of a bunch of kids in the hallway. It went on for longer than he could tolerate, so he opened the room door to tell them to hush, only to find the hallway empty. He could still hear the children, so figuring they were in an adjoining room, he called down to the front desk to complain. The man at the front desk claimed to be certain there were no kids staying on that floor, but that he was certain the noise would subside in a bit. He offered to send up some earplugs. My coworker was a bit annoyed. How can you say there's no kids there when I'm hearing kids? But he went back to bed and eventually fell asleep. The next day when he was checking out, a different clerk made the mistake of asking the routine question. Was everything satisfactory with your stay? My coworker gave her an earful about the noisy kids and how the other clerk had dismissed his complaints. The clerk looked a little uncomfortable and said in a low voice, So we're not supposed to talk about our history with guests but please do a Google search for Rachel David and you'll understand what happened to you. We get similar complaints every few weeks and we try to never put kids on that floor. In the van on the way to the airport, he read on his phone the story of how a mother, Rachel David, had tossed her seven children off the 11th floor balcony of the hotel, then called the International Dunes to their deaths before jumping herself. While attending college, I went on a road trip with a good friend of mine to watch a sports team in a big game being played in Florida. We were huddling down the Florida Turnpike at 80 miles per hour, around 2 in the morning. I had a CB radio in my truck at the time, and tuned in to Channel 19, when out of the darkness, a voice from the radio then said, in the creepiest way possible, I didn't know you Tennessee boys could read a map. We responded with some nervous laughter. Turns out it was a trucker that saw us pass him as my buddy was looking at our map, trying to find some place for us to pull over and rest a bit, and he noticed our Tennessee license plate. He was super helpful and told us there wasn't much around where we were, but there was a motel we could try up the road. We thanked him and headed that way. Getting off the exit and following his directions brought us to a motel that, I kid you not, looked exactly like the one from the movie Psycho. We went into the office, but there were no lights on, and it appeared to be empty. A quick walk down the handful of rooms yielded no more lights, people, other cars, or any signs of life in general. We went back into the office just to see if we had missed a sign or something, and I said very loudly, Hello? At that moment, a young guy that had been asleep on a cot behind the front desk got up and asked us what we needed. We said we wanted a room. He responded, Pick whichever one you want. They're all unlocked. We ended up picking one and had two queen beds. They appeared reasonably clean as far as motels go, but it was creepily outdated. The bathrooms were completely covered in old tile that was brownish green, and for some reason it reminded me of an old high school gym locker room. We took turns showering and tried to get a bit of rest, which ended up in us laying on top of the comforters on the bed since that seemed like the most hygienic thing we could do. We napped off and on for around an hour. Realizing that we weren't going to get any rest, we went back to talk to the guy in the office. 
After waking him up and telling him that after our showers we'd rather just head back out, we asked him how much we owed him. His response? Uh, I don't know. How about ten bucks? We paid the man and left. Weirdest and possibly cheapest lodging I think I've ever experienced. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked and how it worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, What's in the bag? Thinking it's probably my stuff and so she said, No, no, it's just my things, it's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine and so since I'm obviously in shock at this time, I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment other than I wanted it back, so I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out the sides of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby and tell them what happened, and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait, and I noticed there's a metal bat on my bed, a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at baseball games, but there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in a hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought she had gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in somehow but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something even though the hotel front desk was adamant there was no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still didn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone and I'm looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it, and then it hit me. I got my coworker and I asked her to help me pull this mirror off the wall. We took down the mirror and there's a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze right through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this, and my boss said, there's still two cop cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kinda rolled her eyes but the young guy said he'll come check it out. They both came back up and looked in the hole and found a pillow, blanket, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for god knows how long. She had access to me in my room at all times. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to them what's going on and all I hear over the radio is, no freaking way. He comes back, takes pictures and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she probably has been there for a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. But nope. It was just a junkie smoking on the other side of my mirror in the wall. She had access to other rooms as well. 
The holes in the walls were from a renovation, and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in other people's rooms as well when they were gone. Anyway, this was insane, and I'm taking a little time off. Hopefully I won't ever have to deal with someone living in my wall ever again. One can only hope. Last January, I celebrated my birthday. It didn't go well. I was playing some computer games alone in my apartment. That would mean that I'd stay up pretty late at night gaming. I was so bored at that time because my friends were out of town. And then it was midnight. And then it was midnight, and I was like, hooray, happy birthday to me. I ate pizza, drank some juice, all that introvert stuff. And then the phone rang. I thought it would be my friends calling to greet me because it's my birthday, but who calls late at night? I hesitated, but still, I answered it. I heard a girl and a man speaking. I didn't recognize the voice. I asked them who they were and told them that they might be calling the wrong person. It sounded like the girl took the phone away from the man and answered me. She told me that they know me and they were looking at me right through the window. The girl sounded drunk because she was giggling. I was like, what? I don't remember giving any strangers my number. I hung up and continued playing some computer games. After a few minutes, the phone rang again. I then answered and told them to stop messing with me, and after that I stood up from my desk and went to look at the window. I didn't see anyone, but I tried to look carefully. I even used my cell phone to zoom in on the other buildings, but I found none. I started to just believe that it was just a prank call and then it rang yet again. I picked the phone up, but I didn't speak. On the other line, they weren't speaking either. It was like they were waiting for me to go first, so I started to ask them what their problem was. The girl then told me that they were indeed outside my apartment waiting for me to open the door. Now I was scared as hell because I don't know who they are or what they want. I ran to my door and locked it and went to my kitchen and grabbed a knife because why the hell not? And then I heard a knock at my door. I jumped from my seat and went straight to my bedroom and locked it, leaving my computer open and the living room lights on. That was the worst birthday I ever had. Nothing else ended up happening and I ended up being okay, but still, that was one of the worst and creepiest birthdays I've ever experienced. And I really hope that I never have to experience something like that ever again. This happened to me when I was a young boy. I'm now in my late 50s and I haven't thought about being 10 years old in a long time. My youngest kid told me about this website a while back, so I thought you may all like to hear the story of someone I would never want to meet ever again. I remember it being around my 10th birthday when everything changed in my life for me and my family. I remember it being the best birthday yet because my mom had secretly saved up enough money to buy me my own bicycle and I was more than thrilled. No more borrowing my older brothers or standing on the back or sitting on the handlebars of a friend's bike. We were by no means of well off when I was young. We didn't have very much, so getting that bike had meant a lot to me. My father was a man who worked a lot and drank even more than he worked. I'm pretty sure he was drunk more than he was ever sober, and because of that, he was hardly ever around. That was okay with me, my siblings, and my mother for the most part. Things were actually nice and peaceful when he wasn't home. And the nights he actually did come home, we knew right away to stay clear from him, be quiet, and leave him alone. We lived outside of a small town down a long dirt road with not very many neighbors nearby. The closest one was a good mile down from us, a really big farmhouse with a lot of fields around them. I remember being friends with their kids as they were around the same age as us, and we went to school together as well. Their mom was very sweet and always offered us something to eat or drink when we would stop down there. And their dad, well, he was the complete opposite of our father. I never seen him drink, yell, or slap them and their mom around. We already knew that not every family was like ours and that some fathers out there actually seemed to care for them. Like I said, I remember it being around my 10th birthday because my mom had baked a big cake for myself, my brother, and my two younger sisters to share. And of course, she had some as well. Then she took me out back where she had hidden the bike from me in one of the sheds. I remember screaming with excitement, hugging and kissing her, 
telling her I loved her and that she was the greatest mom ever. I hopped on it right away and took up off down the road to test it out. It was a great feeling in that moment. When something so great happens, you kind of forget the regular hell life you seem to live every other day. It's hard to explain, I guess. Things were good the next couple of days. My father hadn't really been home for almost a week probably at that point. Sometimes he would just stop in for a few moments here or there. I guess to check up to make sure my mom hadn't left him or anything. When I was that age, I hardly recall at any point in time when he was home for more than one or two nights in a week, and never two nights in a row. We the kids never knew what he was doing, nor did we ever really want to know. We just knew it was a better home life when he wasn't around. I remember riding my bike down the dirt road and on my way home from running into town to pick something up at the grocery store for my mom, when my dad's pickup truck had passed me and kept heading on down toward home. It made me want to not even go back home, but really, what else could I do? The sun was starting to go down, and normally if he did come home, it was right after work, or very late at night after he left God knows where. So, it was kind of odd he was on his way home at this time of the day. By the time I pulled up to the yard, I could already hear the yelling. I could hear my mom's voice trying to reason with him, and then I hear my dad's voice overpowering hers. I heard something smash, and I didn't want to go inside. I could hear my little sisters bawling, and then I heard my mom crying too. My older brother just happened to be down at the neighbor's place that had the farmhouse. I really didn't want to go inside at this point. I heard another smash. I decided to go in because I couldn't leave my mom and sisters in there alone with them. I peeked in the window of the door before I actually walked in, and I saw the house getting destroyed right in front of my family by my crazy drunk father. I tried opening the door slightly and getting my sister's attention to come out, but my dad had seen and went from focusing on them to focusing on me. I blocked a lot of this out, but from what I can remember, he turned and went straight for me and picked me up by my shoulders and started screaming in my face. My mom was behind him begging him to put me down, but he just turned and gave her another slap in the face, and she backed down. From what I could tell that was coming out of him, he was livid when he saw me riding down the road on a bike that he knew wasn't my brother's. When he got home, he confronted my mom on where it came from and how I was on it. He got it out of her that she had secretly been stashing away money to save up to get me the bike, and my dad had lost it when she told him that. I'm sure he was probably on a five or six heavy drinking binge at this point because I remember the smell of his breath was like sour whiskey pouring in my nostrils as he screamed at me. He was sure that my mother was hiding other things from him, and he was going to find out what. That is why he started tearing up the house. And the five minutes it took from him passing me on the road until I got there, he had done quite a number on the house. All the furniture was thrown around and lamps and pictures had been totally smashed. He threw me against one of the walls and as I looked up from the floor, he had stomped into the kitchen and then smashed what was left of my birthday cake against the back door. Both my sisters were huddled in the corner holding each other while my mom cried and had blood running down her face. That was it for me. This was the worst I had ever seen my father, and I was scared. I ran out of the house, hopped on my bike, and started heading towards the neighbors. We didn't have a telephone at the time, but I knew that they did, and I was going to call the police in town to stop him. I hardly made my way out of the driveway when I heard the front door open, and I heard my father yelling at me to get back in the house. I just kept on pedaling, thinking I needed to get to the neighbor's house and everything would be better. That's when I heard his truck start up. I looked behind me as he was backing out of the driveway and started heading towards me. I could see the neighbor's house in the distance and just kept on pedaling until I started to see the headlights getting closer and closer. I looked behind me and he was so close that I knew he was going to hit me. I remember just jumping off the bike towards the side of the road and tumbling down into the side of the field. I shut up and just started running across the field towards my neighbors, hearing my dad yelling but not really caring. When I looked behind me, I seen that my father had already turned around and was heading back towards our house. I got to the neighbors a few minutes later and pounded on the door. Their mom opened the door and took a step back, and at this point I was sobbing and shaking and probably didn't look like my normal self. She took me inside her house and then called her husband to get in there. I was in the middle of telling them what happened when my brother and his friend walked in from playing out back, and in about two seconds he was out the door heading towards home. The mom called the police in town and they said they would send someone out right away. About 10 minutes had passed and no police had shown up yet, so I begged the husband to please drive me down to my house. 
I didn't know what was happening and I was scared. He agreed since he knew my little sisters and mom were there. About halfway down the road we passed my bike. It was completely mangled up. My dad ran it over with his truck. I started crying again, partly because I loved that bike and mostly because I could have still been on it when he did that. We get to the house and my father's truck is gone now. Apparently my brother ran all the way home, picked up a baseball bat that was on the side of the house and with no hesitation walked into the living room and smashed my dad's kneecap in. As he laid there screaming, my brother grabbed my sister and mother and ran into one of the bedrooms. He managed to crawl out to his truck and drive away though. The cop showed up just a few minutes after the neighbor and I arrived and took a look at everything that had happened. They found my father about an hour later one town over at the local tavern. Said it wasn't very hard to find him since he was a well-known drunk in the area and the bars were the first place they were going to look for him. They arrested him pretty much on the spot. That night, after the police found my father, the neighbors invited us to stay with them for however long we needed to. My mom was embarrassed but also so very thankful for their help. We only stayed for a couple of days which was enough time for my mom to make arrangements to leave that town and go live with my aunt for a while, which was a couple hundred miles away from where we lived. I never did see my father again after that and I've never really minded that. I know he wasn't in jail too long because shortly after we got settled in at my aunt's house is when the phone calls and letters started. But my mom never caved or went back. I mean, who would? After about a year or so, he finally gave up and agreed to divorce. I never really paid much attention to that, as I was still young and was living a different life than I had before. We had stayed with my aunt for a couple of years until my mom saved up enough money after getting a job to get our own place. At that point, my brother was 16 or 17, so he was also helping bring in money from his job, as well as myself with a newspaper route. I even saved up enough money to get myself another bike. Now that my dad was no longer around, life was better than it had ever been. Thank you for letting me share my story. Greetings from India. Wanted to share an element experience my sister and I experienced. We are pretty close, my sister and I, even though I'm older to her by four years. This happened last November on my birthday. Now, as you all know, our country is not the safest for girls, not advisable for girls to travel alone, etc. But we usually find a way around to do normal things and have normal experiences and dodge the jerks. I live in one of the metro cities in the south, so it's comparatively safer. But all girls who are born here or live here have a radar of finding or dodging the weirdos. I had just got out of a really long relationship, 11 years, and wanted to spend my first single birthday in a really long time away from the city and the people I know. I had gone on a couple of solo trips and was pretty confident about taking care of myself and sniffing out the bloody weirdos. So we both decided to go to this beach destination I used to frequently go to. This would be my fifth time there. Every time I've been there, I've stayed at the same shack so the folks running the place are familiar with me. We decided to stay at the place as we felt it would be safer and since the season had just begun, this place had more tourists compared to the other places. Cause you know, it's always safe to be around people. We were wrong. So this beach gets a lot of tourists who first come to visit but decide to stay back indefinitely cause it's spiritual well known for the temple in the town. Beautiful, affordable, around three to five dollars per night, and they usually get a discount from the shack owners if they're staying for long. And cause you know, the eat, pray, love. This time around, there were around 50 to 60 tourists on the beach, so it was pretty private and secluded. We reached the day before my birthday and checked into our shack, we notice a big group of guys staying in the shack opposite to us. They seemed to be in their own world and didn't bother us. Apart from the big group of guys, eight to nine, we met and shared a smoke with a French couple who were staying at the same place. We decided to unpack, change, shower, and head out to do some exploring. On our way out, we passed by the owner of the shack chatting with a couple of tourists slash regulars. 
I saw a couple of familiar faces, shack owner's wife and some tourists who I've seen on my previous visits, and I'm guessing he stays there now. We walk around, read, play with the beach doggies, and have dinner at neighboring places, and back to our shack by ten-something in the night. We chill outside our shack, listen to music, talk, and by twelve-something, it's my birthday now, we decide to call it a night. I made sure we leave the light outside the door on, that way we can see through the blurred glass if someone's outside. We had played in the beach earlier, so we had put our shorts out to dry. Shack is pretty small, our bed was facing the door, and a double window right next to the door, so this shack is basically a hut made of bricks with a tiled roof. There's a small gap where the roof meets the walls so we can hear everything happening outside, and vice versa. My sister is out cold once we hit the bed, and I was up for a bit replying to my birthday texts, and passed out by 1.20am. I remember this distinctly, as that was the last text I sent to my friend. At some point I wake up with someone knocking on the door. At first I thought it was just a dream, and decided to go back to sleep. And as I was about to shut my eyes, I see someone outside the blurry window. Now I'm wide awake and on high alert. It could just be one of the other folks staying there, just walking around, but why the hell would they be knocking on the door at 2.10am in the night? I give it a minute or two to see if I was just imagining the knock. Maybe I heard loud footsteps of someone passing by. The weirdo knocks again. No mistaking this for loud footsteps or anything else. I'm torn between waking my sister up or not. She panics easily, so I nudge her to wake up and whisper that there's someone at the door. She thinks I'm dreaming, so she's asking me to go back to sleep. That's when we see the figure outside the window. But this time, this fool is trying to open the sliding windows from the outside. I usually travel with pepper spray and a Swiss knife, so I get up to get both. I was mad. I plan to stab the hell out of his hand if he opened that window. He takes turn between trying to push the door open and trying to get the window open. Since the outside light was on, we could see that the person is shirtless and fair-skinned and wearing blue pants and shorts. My sister's anxiety increases every time he's at the window, trying to get it open. So on his fifth attempt, she says, Who the hell is out there? He stops then and starts walking around our shack in circles. Earlier, we had noticed a couple of old chairs and tables stashed behind our shack in the next one. We could hear him fiddle with the chairs and tables to find access, maybe? I don't know. At least he's given up trying to break in. No way we can go back to sleep now, so we put the lights on so he knows we're awake and on guard. Now we are both furious and ready to kick this guy's ass. He stops circling the shack after a good half an hour. We pack the next morning and decided to move to the next place. We step out of the shack and notice the clothes we had hung out to dry are missing. I talk to the owner's wife and tell her about last night's incident. She seems apologetic and said she heard the big group of guys making noise and playing loud music till late in the night. We heard them too, but we know the music and party stopped way before someone tried to break in because we would have heard it otherwise. I tell her this and she seemed a little off and confused about the timings. We were waiting at the cafe for the owner's wife to return. She wanted to make sure there were no damages, the usual protocol. We see the same tourist who was chatting with the owner the previous day, the same guy I've seen before during my last two visits. He's never talked to me before, or the previous day. As he's passing by, we see he's wearing jeans shorts, he stops to say hi and asks how was our stay and if we're having fun. He clearly sees us with our backpacks and really pissed off. We had passed by this guy many times the day before, but he decides to say hi and talk to us now and ask if we're having fun? At this point, the owner's wife is back after inspecting the shack for damages, and she tells the guy we're leaving because of the noise in the night. He has the balls to tell us, are you sure? Maybe another night here will change your mind. He proceeds to ask us if we know where we're staying. I wouldn't tell him even if I did know. I won't tell because I don't want the noise to follow us to the new place. He smirks and says, let's hope. 
I'm not entirely sure if it was this guy who was trying to break in, but the whole weird conversation and sudden interest in us made it convincing. Maybe we're just assuming it's him. Maybe he saw we were pissed off and wanted to have a conversation. Luckily, we moved to a better shack and made friends with the owners. Had a fun birthday after that. I recently moved in an apartment close to my workplace in the city. It is a garden level apartment that faces a parking garage for the city's education department and a patio like section of foliage, trees, leaves, etc. Connected to this patio is the alleyway. I have been living here for two months and the apartment itself is pretty quiet. Most of the tenants are just normal blue collar folk, grad students and hipsters basically. Nothing crazy or weird living here. A needle exchange opened up basically across the alleyway this summer and has attracted unsavory characters. In the US, needle exchanges are extremely controversial and are only allowed in several states. Many of them have been hanging around the back of the alleyway and pooping and peeing out there. The leasing office and landlord of the building is trying to get the city to help with this problem. My first encounter with these peeping druggy toms was one Saturday morning. I awoke to hear all this moaning and groaning from outside the patio slash tree area. When I opened my eyes and peeped outside, I saw a guy, completely high on something, sharpening sticks outside right by the window. I was super scared, but I didn't know if he saw me because I quickly hid under my kitchen table and called non-emergency police. They sent someone out to investigate like 30 minutes later, and when the cop car appeared, he moaned out and walked away from the scene before they got to the patio area. The second time was me sleeping the night before work. It was literally the night of my birthday. I heard pounding at around 11pm and awoke to it. I had my window slightly cracked open to let cool air in, don't have AC, and I heard the sound of rap music coming from either a small speaker or phone. I originally thought the pounding was from a neighbor or upstairs. I then realized that the pounding was coming from the window behind me. It got worse and worse with accompanied moaning and blaring rap music. I called the non-emergency police and they told me they would send someone out and take a look. This continued for another 15 minutes and I had to go to the bathroom desperately. I couldn't just sit there and hide in my bed. I crawled to my kitchen got a knife, and went to the bathroom. I figured the burglar bars on my apartment window would deter the pounding. The pounding stopped when I came out of the bathroom. It got almost too quiet. Something about the vibes, the feeling, just didn't feel right. I decided, I don't know why still, to peek through the blind slats and shine my phone flashlight through the blinds. What I saw was the guy's face staring right through me in the blinds. It was horrific. His pupils were completely dilated. Like a cat's almost, he could see me and the knife. He pounded right back at me through the burglar blinds and screamed, I'm going to kill you, you freaking bitch. I don't want to know what he was on, but he was extremely aggressive and seemed invincible on it. I got so scared and was in a ton of shock, I shut the crack while he was continuing to pound and turned up his rap music. I ended up crawling back down to my low-lying bed and calling the police, 911. What ended up happening was the cops came once again about 30 minutes late or so, and when they came, I heard the guy moaning in alarm and saw him bicycling off as I peeked through the blinds on a BMX bicycle. When I talked to the cops, they were more concerned about how he looked like than what he did and seemed overall unconcerned and not very reassuring. I ended up missing work, not getting much sleep, and having to spend half the day recuperating during my birthday. My solution now is shutting the blinds tighter and closing the window at night and trying to use the swamp cooler and fans before nightfall. I'm also thinking about getting curtains to put over the blinds, but overall, I feel this is challenging due to the heat and not having AC. I want to stay cool and the nighttime breeze really helps but it's tricky because there's druggy creeps outside it seems. 
when I told my boss that I wasn't coming into work the following day. He recommended that I seek a room at a higher ground. I don't know if that will help, and possibly could be more dangerous, since there's no burglar bars on the first floor and above, while my garden level does and really is what saved my butt from that guy bursting in and wanting to kill me. I'm an extremely frightened chick from this experience, and I've gotten more paranoid since. My boyfriend has been really kind this past weekend. This happened on this Thursday night, and offered to stay over more. Since then, it's been quiet, but I heard someone last night yelling outside so loud I could hear it through the shut window. I feel the cops have not been helpful, and don't take this seriously. This is my mom and dad's story. It was their honeymoon, and they were driving along the Bruce Highway into a city called Rockhampton. It was late at night, around 8pm-ish, and they had been driving most of the day. There's a very long stretch of road before you come into the city that is just bush, kilometers of it. At night, the bush can be very scary. They had not passed any cars for quite some time, probably an hour or two. Out of nowhere, headlights appeared a long way behind them in their rearview mirror. That's fine, whatever. They keep driving as normal. Then the headlights start getting closer and closer. Dad is driving and says something like, What a bloody turkey! Look how fast he's driving! The car comes right up to them with their high beams on and follows them for about five minutes like that. Mom and Dad have a conversation about why can't the person just overtake them. Then the car completely backs off, like slows right down almost to a complete stop and hangs about one to two kilometers away for a good ten to fifteen minutes. My mom and dad both think that was super weird and creepy, but whatever. They just keep driving. Then the car speeds up again, tailgating high beam and sort of swerving into the other lane as if to overtake them. This goes on for another five-ish minutes. Mom and dad are both really scared now. Remember, this is the days before cell phones. And besides, there would have been no reception in that area to call for help even if they had them. It's not over yet, though. The car backs off again, but not as far as before. The car hangs back there for about a minute before hitting the gas and absolutely flying past both my mom and dad and finally overtaking them. There appeared to be one person in the car, but they couldn't really see what they looked like. There was also no number plate on the car to identify it. And I know my dad has told me heaps of times before, but I actually can't remember what sort of car it was now. I feel like it was some sort of sedan thing, definitely white. The car disappears up the road as if it were never there. Mom and dad are shaken to their core but pleased it was seemingly over. Well, it's not quite over yet. The road now becomes a bit more windy, previously it was almost straight. Mom and dad come around a corner and the car is parked in the middle of the road, facing them high beams on both driver and passenger doors wide open and the man standing in front of the car with his arms spread wide open, spread as if to make them stop the car. Mom was screaming at dad, just hit him, don't stop, just hit him. And my dad didn't stop and just drove around the man's car on the right hand side of it. The man tried to get in front of my dad as he made this maneuver but couldn't quite get there in time. He was very close to the car and dad nearly hit him. My dad absolutely floored it to get away from the man. They aren't sure how long they drove like that for, but they didn't slow back to the speed limit until they started to come into the city limits. They made it to their hotel and parked the car at the back of the hotel so that you couldn't see it from the road because it was on the side of the highway and passing traffic could see the cars parked there. My mom was quite hysterical and told the reception lady what happened. They called the police and reported it, but never found the car or the driver. Fast forward many years later. My mom was watching the news and she saw a man that had just been arrested. My mom screamed and called my dad into the lounge room. They both agreed it was the man they saw. They were absolutely adamant. I can't find evidence to suggest the man was active in Queensland during that time, but I certainly won't call my mom and dad liars because of what they saw. I imagine it was just another creepy hillbilly who looked very similar to the guy on the TV.
but who really knows? So my significant other and I were talking once after reading stories to each other from this very subreddit and started telling one another about creeps we had known in the past. It became clear after a while that we had known the same creep mere months apart before we had ever met each other. So let me take you to that very tale, the tale of Carl. So I would say about eight years before my significant other and I had met, my ex and I were in the market for a roommate to take up the slack on the rent that the previous roommate left behind. Well, we found it in an individual named Carl. Now, things seemed to be okay with Carl. He went to class and work on time, kept the place clean, and paid rent on time. We even hung out as a group whenever we could arrange it and watch things together. So we thought everything was cool. So cool, in fact, we saw no problem with leaving Carl alone in the apartment while my ex and I went on a trip with my ex's family. During the trip, Carl let us know he needed to move out because he had lost his job and was having some trouble finding another one. This is very important to the story. We said that it was fine and he just had to be out by the time we got back, and he said that was no problem since this gave him almost 60 days to find a new place, and we would just take the rent he couldn't pay out of the security deposit. So time goes by and we get back and see a bunch of suitcases and no Carl, and my ex and I think, oh, he really cut this close, but whatever, these things happen. Then we see a random woman exit Carl's room, but think nothing of it because they must be here to help Carl move, right? Well, nope. This woman, Nancy, walks up to my ex and I and asks, who are you and what are you doing in Carl's apartment? Then the story unfolds. So while we were gone, Carl decided they weren't super big on the idea of leaving, and they had moved Nancy in, telling them they owned the whole big studio apartment. Those bags from earlier? Well, they were her bags. She was moving in into our room. Carl had told her that my ex and I had skipped out and he was left behind to take care of our stuff and throw it all away and this and that and the other. Just an endless sea of lies. We had to show Nancy the lease and our text to prove that Carl was subleasing from us before she would believe us, and we offered her Carl's spot since we did have a vacancy, which they accepted since they had just moved out of their dorms and had nowhere else to go now. Things are going okay, and we're all geared up to face Carl when he gets home from work, when Nancy mentions something offhandedly. Apparently this morning, Carl had put peanuts in the milk before he left. Now, my ex has a terrible peanut allergy and loves milk. If he had taken one sip, they probably would have died, and Carl knew that. So, with attempted murder now revealed and single white female coming to mind, Carl strolls in, sees us, and says out loud, Oh crap. Yeah, oh crap is right. He was very surprised that Nancy was not on his side and that he really had to leave right that second and that she had ratted him out about the milk, which he tried to get my ex to drink to prove it wasn't tainted. I repeat, Carl told my ex to drink the milk repeatedly to prove his innocence. Yeah, that's a big no. So we made Carl pack at that very instant and leave because we were young and didn't think the police would take any of this seriously since they had a record of avoiding things that were not cut and dry or straight up murder. Now at this point you may be saying to yourself, work, but I thought Carl didn't have a job and that's why they had to leave. That's where my significant other whom I would not meet for years mind you came in. You see, the place that Carl got a job at was my significant other's place of work. Carl was hired to stock the shelves and that was it. Just stock the shelves. Not clean or do inventory or anything else. Just stock the shelves. Carl proceeded to follow customers around the store and harass them about what they were going to buy so that he would know what to get more of from the back. He went so far as to pick through their carts to see what items they had while they were still shopping and follow them through the aisles. Mostly the women. Carl would also sit on the floor of the aisles with Nancy and just talk, blocking everyone out and not moving unless someone told him to. And since this was a specialty shop with intermittent traffic, this could be quite a while, but it was also preferable to him harassing the customers, so management let it go. So what finally got Carl fired? Well, the owner of the store came in very early one day to do inventory and saw that lights were on in the basement of the building. They followed those lights to the stockroom and found Carl sleeping there on a pile of product. 
When they told him to leave, he asked him when he could come back, and they told him never, to which he seemed rather angry. He tried just showing up to work several times after that like nothing happened, and everyone had to keep kicking him out. From what I understand, he had a place to go, he just didn't want to pay rent there, and thought if he slept in the stockroom he wouldn't have to, I guess. The guy was weird. No one including myself or my significant other knows has seen or heard from Carl since, and we're all fine with that. There's a girl that has been stalking and harassing me since October 2018. We were in the same class at high school six years ago. She was super shy, never spoke in class, and barely had any friends. I can't remember speaking to her more than once or twice throughout all of high school. To me, she didn't even exist. Then all of a sudden, many months ago, I woke up to a message in my Facebook inbox that read, Screw white people. She's Asian, from what country I do not know. I thought this was really strange, so I tried to reply back, what's going on, but she had blocked my messages. I decided to just ignore it and go on with my life. About a month had passed and I woke up to yet another message in my inbox. She had sent me a screenshot of an Instagram account in my name. No posts or followers, just an empty account with my name. I kind of freaked out a little and tried to reply, but yet again she had blocked my messages. I tried to find the account on Instagram, but couldn't. My name is very uncommon, so the possibilities that this was another guy's account was very slim. It certainly wasn't my account. I was very confused and kind of scared that she had created an account with my name and would post things pretending to be me. I contacted one of her high school friends and asked if she could deliver a message for me since I had no way of reaching her. To my surprise, they weren't friends anymore and hadn't spoken in months. I told my closest friends about what's happening, and they told me they had received some strange messages as well. I was seriously confused by this point. This one girl who nobody talked to or had any kind of relationship with was sending pictures of Instagram accounts, weird memes, and three-word sentences that made zero sense to me and many of my friends. I tried to think of why she did this, had we treated her badly at some point, but I couldn't think of anything that we had done. I remember giving her a piece of gum one day, but that's about as close as any communication that happened between us. I decided I would just try to ignore her and hope she wouldn't send me any more messages. But then around Christmas time, I woke up to my Facebook exploding with notifications and messages. I think I had around a good 100 plus notifications. She had been sharing all of my profile pictures and posts. I'm seriously freaking out at this point, and I opened my messenger. I received around 50 to 60 messages that all read, kill yourself. I tried to message her again, but surprise, surprise, she had blocked my messages. I was becoming really angry at this point. I clicked on her Facebook profile to block her and get rid of her for good. Before I went to block her, I scrolled down her wall, and she had been sharing literally hundreds of posts and pictures of me, my friends, and some other people I had no idea who they were. I did some detective work and found her sister's Facebook profile and decided to send her a message. I took screenshots of everything she had done and sent it to her, asking why she was doing this. She totally freaked out when she saw what her crazy stalker sister had done. The stalker had deleted her sister on Facebook because of an argument they had around October when this all started, so she hadn't seen anything she had done. She promised me she would talk to her crazy stalker sister and make her stop. I received a message from the sister a few hours later that she had talked to the stalker and promised she would stop, and she apologized. I was so happy this would finally be over, and I thanked her. Another few months pass, and we're now in February 2019. I hadn't received any messages since I talked to her sister, and I had honestly forgot about everything that had happened. Two days ago, I was playing some games with my friends on my PC and talking on Discord. My phone was on the table and I saw it light up. I had received a notification. I wouldn't bother to check it before the game was done. A few seconds after, I get another one and another one. I could see my phone in the corner of my eye. Notifications came swarming in. Then I remembered the crazy stalker girl and got a really awful feeling in my stomach, praying this wasn't her this time. I stopped playing and picked up my phone, notifications still swarming in. 
The stalker was sharing my pictures and my posts yet again, and all had captions like, kill yourself, or I hope you die. I instantly blocked her. A few minutes later, it happened again. Someone with another username was sharing my pictures. I blocked the account instantly. She had created at least 10 accounts, and I was desperately blocking all of them as fast as I could as soon as I saw a notification. I decided to message her sister again, and I told her I was going to report this to the police if she wouldn't stop. She told me she would talk to her. Angry, confused, and kind of scared, I went back to the gaming session talking to my friends about it. I went to sleep a few hours later. I woke up late the next day. It was really hard to sleep after thinking about all that was happening. My cousin had received some messages from my crazy stalker. She had told him that I owed her money. I kept my calm and I told him the whole story and that he should just go along with it. I wanted to see where this was going. She thought that my cousin was my father. He's a lot older than me so I could see why she would think that. They had a really long conversation where she claimed that I had both stolen and hacked her phone and lent money from her, and that I was the reason she lost her scholarship and had to move. She said that I owed her $10,000 which later became $50,000, and then again she raised the amount to $100,000 later in the conversation. All of this is of course a big crazy lie. I'm so confused as to why she's doing this to me. I have no idea what I've done to her and I'm going to report this to the police tomorrow. I'm really freaking scared of what she might accuse me of next, or if she's going to show up at my door someday. All of this is happening six years after the last time I saw her. I have an update. So I just came back home after talking with the police. They told me I had a strong case and could press charges if I wanted to. I decided not to do it for now. I don't want to make it harder than it has to be. I will give her one last chance to stop. They will call her today and tell her to stop or face charges. Any further contact with me or my family will cause her to see the consequences of her actions. Either way, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get her a restraining order if she doesn't comply. I would also like to add that I don't think she's a violent person, and she's never even threatened my life directly, nor have I ever feared for my life. This plays a huge part of why I didn't press charges. I firmly believe that something terrible has happened with her within the last year and that she's really sick and in need of help. Her family knows about the situation and it's up to them or the authorities to make sure she gets the help she needs. What actually bothered me the most about this whole situation was the false accusations and not the sharing of my pictures and messages itself. I'm happy with my decision and I hope I made the right call. My childhood was far from idyllic. In fact, it was pretty horrific. Kids growing up today think they know what suffering is because they don't have the latest high-tech gadget or were offended by something they saw online. I remember the nights where I would go entirely without food. Sitting in the corner of a crack house watching people exchange sexual favors for blow, my father would take all the money we earned together from power washing houses and would use it for his next fix. I was never his priority, only a tool from which he could benefit from. I grew up in the worst areas of the ghetto. I had to think like an adult very early in life to survive. At least once a week on my walks home from school, I would have to fight. That's just how it was. If you were weak, you wouldn't last. Fortunately for me, I managed to distance myself from my father and began to build a decent life for myself. I didn't let my upbringing define who I was. That's not to say that it didn't have a profound effect on my mind. I found a night job working on the docks, unloading produce, and after a short while I met the woman who would eventually become my wife. We started a family together. Having that structure in my life helped to anchor me. Having people to care for kept me calm, and helped me not to lose myself in the terrible memories of my own upbringing. I thank God for my supportive wife and my kids. Without them, I'd probably be in prison or dead by now. My desire to just beat the shit out of drug dealers, deadbeat parents, or anyone who even remotely reminded me of my father would never be able to be repressed. Once enough time had gone by, I decided to try and make peace with my father and introduce him to my family. I wasn't thrilled with the idea and was worried about how I would react when I saw him face to face after so long. I figured as a father myself now, the best example I could set for my kids was to at least attempt to forgive him. 
and try to permanently extinguish that furious wildfire of anger that was burning in my soul. So we reconnected, and we set a date to meet at my house on a weekend. Now my father was a convicted felon and a piece of shit. I told him that to his face. I made it clear to him that I would be doing the world a favor by choking him to death and disposing of his body, and he seemed to acknowledge that I was right. I didn't want to give the impression that I was trying to bond with him. I was mostly looking just to make peace. Several times, he said something that was overly familiar, and I had to not so subtly remind him that he had to watch himself. We eventually went out to my workshop after the kids had gone to bed and sat down to talk. We had some beers to take the edge off and began to have something of a civil conversation. We talked about other relatives and made some jabs about them that made us both chuckle. By the time 1am rolled around, I was six or seven beers deep. I wasn't drunk, but I had a strong buzz going. I mentioned that I had an old friend who I used to work with at the docks, who we could score some weed from, and my father agreed to come with me. I gave my friend a call and wasn't surprised to find that he was still awake. We got into my father's car and drove for about 15 minutes before arriving at my buddy's trailer. He was an older guy, very much set in his ways, and not willing to provide us with any kind of discount on the merchandise. But we made a deal, rolled a joint, and shot the shit with him for a while. On our way back to my place, my father was driving, while I reclined in the passenger seat, disappointed in the quality of weed that we had paid too much for. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and the roads were empty. My father was driving about 65 on a 35 road. We rounded the corner and discovered a cop car planted right in the middle of the road. It wasn't off to the side, but instead sitting dead center on the median. My father immediately eased off the gas, but didn't hit the brake. We drove past the patrol car at about 55 miles an hour, and I watched in the rearview mirror as the cop's lights came on, and he began to follow us. I said something aloud to my father, along the lines of, He's coming for us. My father acknowledged it, and pulled off to the side of the road, next to a gas station. After the cop pulled up behind us, he shone his spotlight on us. I felt my heart sink, on top of the speeding. My father was a convicted felon. Both of us had drugs in our pockets, and I had a loaded gun under the seat. I looked at my father and said, Okay, so here's the plan. I'm drunk as shit, and I called you to come pick me up and drive me home. You're pissed off at me because you were sleeping, but you're being a responsible parent. If the cop asks me to step out of the car, I'm going to stagger around like an idiot and make myself throw up. I feel like I should point out that I was still incredibly buzzed from the alcohol I had drank earlier, and on top of that I was being a bit paranoid because I had just burned one. It was a bad combination, but there was something stirring within me, something that I hadn't felt in a long time. The cop stepped out of his car and called over his loudspeaker for my father to step out of the vehicle with his hands up. My father complied, and I caught a glimpse of the officer. He was a very young man maybe 21 or so. I turned back to the dashboard and made myself focus on it and refused to turn my head in case I made eye contact with him. Now for some context, my father was shirtless and wearing a gold chain. I looked like I had been awake for days. The car was a piece of shit. Everything about us screamed at trouble. From outside the car, I heard the officer speaking to my father. Sir, is that alcohol I smell on your breath? Well, if it is, it's ancient. How's that? I haven't had a drink all day. He asked my father where he was heading, and I heard him respond that he was driving his drunken son home, just like I had told him. A sudden idea struck me, and I pulled out my cell phone. I illuminated my screen and held it to my ear, and proceeded to pretend that I was arguing with my wife while being completely hammered. I made it loud so the cop could hear it. Yes, honey. Yes, I'm on my way home now. I know you told me not to drink. Yes, I know. You were right. H honey, honey, I'm sorry. I'm on my way home. I'm on my way home right now. I really made a show of being wasted and angry. I even threw in some stuttering to make it seem like she was interrupting me. I drowned out what the cop and my father were saying. 
In that time, a second cop may have pulled up behind us. For some reason, I got the sense of another car arriving, but I didn't know for sure because I refused to turn around. I continued to make myself stare at the dashboard. I felt more than I saw the cop coming around to my side of the car, and it was at that moment where all my thinking changed. I suddenly witnessed my life in a microscope and saw my wife and kids, and I thought about how proud I was of them. I could have just stayed home. Now I was here, at what might have been the most critically important moments of my life. I pulled the gun out from under the seat and cocked back the hammer. It was a fully loaded seven shot revolver. In that moment, I felt like a passenger in my own body, and for some reason I thought I knew exactly what was going to happen. That feeling that I had earlier had taken over. I was convinced that the cop was going to open the door and put his gun in my face. You could not have told me otherwise in that moment, and I was prepared to shoot him. It wasn't even that I was considering doing it. The decision had already been made. It was like a stage play that had already been written, and we were now acting it out. He was going to attempt to arrest me, and there was no way that I would be separated from my family to rot in jail. I would rather die which I knew was exactly what would happen if I shot him. Cop killers around here only ever went home in body bags. I watched the officer reach out for the door handle. The whole time I was thinking, this guy is dead, and he doesn't even know it. He could have had a wife and kids of his own, and tomorrow, they're going to be planning his funeral, just as my own family would be planning mine, and it was only a few moments away. It was going to be so easy. I would just extend my arm and fire as he opened the door. And then, I would shoot my father, eliminate that piece of shit from the world for all the suffering he had caused me, and for all the memories of the nights I went hungry. I knew that this was going to devastate my family, and I felt bad for them. I considered myself to be a good father, much better than my own had been, and I knew that they loved me. I felt the tears begin to come, and I didn't fight them. And I think that was the scariest part of this whole experience. I knew that what I was doing was beyond fucked up and irrational on almost every level, but I still was going to go through with it. I closed my eyes and waited for the car door to open, but that never happened. I opened my eyes and the cop was gone. He was walking back to speak with my father again. From what my father told me, the officer approached my door and extended his hand to pull the handle. Then he paused for about 10 seconds. There was a silence, and the police officer shook his head, lowered his hand, and simply walked away. My father said that 10 seconds felt like a minute and a half. The cop cited my father for speeding and told him that he was a good parent. After my father got back in the car, we drove away in silence. Once we were about six miles away and the cop was long gone, I silently rolled down the window, pointed the gun outside, and fired all seven shots into the ground. This startled my father so much that he swerved and nearly went off the road. He hadn't known about my gun. After I rolled the window back up, he looked at me and said, You probably shouldn't carry a gun while you drink. And I replied back, You and I shouldn't drink together at all. It had been exactly what I feared. Being in close proximity to my father brought all the painful memories back to the surface, and the worst side of me came with them. The side of me that was hostile, irrational, and violent. I had decided to kill a cop over a traffic stop without a second thought, and I'm positive that I would have done it had he opened the door. That was five years ago, and I haven't had a drink with my father since, and I can't afford to have him in my life anymore after what almost happened. And to be clear, I don't blame him for what I almost did, I blame myself. But being with him, especially after drinking, puts me in a frame of mind where I can no longer think rationally, and I remember the kill or be killed mentality from my childhood. I had nearly killed an innocent man over a bag of shitty weed. I truly feel that something divine stepped in between us that night, and made the officer pause and reconsider opening that door. You can call it instinct or luck. But I consider luck finding a dollar bill under your car seat, not something that steps in in the last moment to prevent tragedy.
so at the time I was a 16 year old female working in McDonald's. Now at the McDonald's I worked at, when you're on headset, you're normally required to be at the first window to also take payment. My job position was customer care manager at the time, so my job was meant to be on the front desk, but 99% of the time they required me behind the tills. So I was having a normal day, working a long shift, but still having a normal working day. I happened to be on headset and first window that day. Anyway, my headset buzzes letting me know there's someone at my drive through lane. I go through to the first window to answer my customer and this is how the conversation ensued. Me. Hello, welcome to McDonald's, what can I get you? Him. Oh wow, you've got a beautiful voice. His voice was very grunty and husky sounding, not off-putting though. We have all sorts of customers come through McDonald's every day, so nothing gave me the creeps at this point, but his voice was very recognizable. Thank you, sir. How very flattering. What can I get you? Uh, I haven't decided yet. Can I just come around to the first window to decide? I want to see who I'm talking to. Now, we weren't very busy, and at this point the creeper hadn't actually creeped me out yet. I mean, all he had done really was pay me a compliment, and we quite often had people complain that they liked the face-to-face contact. So, it was definitely not unusual to get a request like this. Mmm, yes sir, that's fine. Wow, you're just as beautiful as you sound. Thank you sir, have you decided what you're going to have to eat? Are you an option? I laughed this off. It was my first job and I wasn't the rude kind of person when someone was paying a compliment. I must also point out that this man must have been around in his 60s. I remember that he had one lazy eye that looked to the left, painfully awful teeth and patchy dark brown hair. At this point, I was getting a little bit uncomfortable now, but was still more than willing to take his order. I'll have a cheeseburger. Okay sir, are you paying cash or card? Without answering my question, he started asking where I'm from and how old I was, etc, etc. But it wasn't until his last few questions that I really got weirded out now. What time do you finish work? Half seven, why? I didn't actually finish at half seven, but half seven was the first number that came into my head when I blurted it out. I finished at eight and would probably do some overtime as well, but I wasn't about to let him know that. You know, I can meet you if you want. I can pick you up outside and we can go somewhere. All the while he's saying this, he has this horrendous grin on his face and keeps winking at me. I'm really sorry sir, but I'm not allowed to meet with customers outside of work, as it's against our employee policy. This was utter BS, but I needed to get him to leave me alone, and this was the only thing I could think of to say at the time. He carries on being insistent, but not getting the picture. I cut the conversation short. Anyway sir, sorry to be rude, but can I have the money for your cheeseburger? Ah, yes. Sorry. See you at half seven. Off he drove to the next window. I was gobsmacked. I'd already said I wasn't going to see him. I was a little bit shocked, but I was not going to go over there and give him the satisfaction of talking to him again. My coworker came to me and said, Ooh, that guy had a major crush on you and wanted your number, but I didn't give it to him. He's old enough to be your dad. Anyway, I explained exactly what had happened and how uncomfortable it made me. Half seven came and my coworker is spooked. Creeper is waiting in the car park for me, just like he said he would. He sat halfway down the car park and you can just see him staring in. Now, our car park wasn't very big. It only had four rows of parking spaces, so he wasn't that far away and would have clocked me the minute I walked out the door. At this point, I'm really freaking out and head to the back of the store where hopefully he can't see me. I had to stay at the back of the store for about 40 minutes before we knew it was safe to come out. Fast forward a week later, and the creepers return to the drive through And guess who's back on headset at window one? Me. I heard his voice and recognized it straight away. Hey, I was hoping I'd hear your voice again. Why didn't you meet me the other day? Just one second, sir. I'll be with you in one second. I immediately handed my headset to my manager and gave him a quick briefing on the situation. He gladly took the headset and dealt with the customer from start to finish. When my manager came back to let me know he had gone, he said the creeper had been asking my name, my address, and my surname. 
My manager said that he was the most creepiest guy he had ever met, and I was never to have anything to do with him again. If he came to work while I was there, afterwards my manager would have me head to the back room while he dealt with the creep. He always asked about me, every single time. I'm a 16-year-old female working as a customer care manager on the front of house for our McDonald's. Now, where I am from when you are front of house, you're required to wear a light stripped top, a yellow neck scarf, and a pencil skirt just below the knee which has a small split up the back. I always buttoned my shirt right up to the very top so I always looked very modest and I would never say a McDonald's uniform is attractive. Anyway, when I worked at McDonald's, I always put my all into everything I did, so I knew tills, drive through drinks, serving, etc. I've also always been someone that will happily have a conversation with someone to make their experience enjoyable and hopefully make them want to come back. I was working on tills when this creeper came through the door. He was a tall blonde bodybuilder, at least around 50 years old though. He came to the till and ordered and didn't look very happy, so I asked the obvious questions. How was your day, etc. He had made small talk and we got to chatting about both of our days. After that, he then tells me, It's nice to see someone small around here for once. Everyone else is so grumpy. Nice enough compliment. I was used to it. He was right though. Not many people here enjoyed this job, but, I mean, it is McDonald's. He starts coming in around once a week on a Wednesday morning. Each morning he would come in, we would have a chat. If I was on the floor, meaning front of house, we would sit and chat at a table. And my managers were fine with this, as they knew it made each customer's experience unique. We got to know each other's names. His name was Michael. I started college on a Wednesday and Thursday and worked at McDonald's part-time. So, my shifts changed. I worked Mondays, Tuesdays, and Saturdays instead of Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And sometimes extra days if they needed me. Michael started coming into McDonald's every day to find when I was working. First red flag, but I figured he was just lonely and needs someone to talk to. Anyway, he worked out my shift pattern and came in on Tuesdays instead, after asking me why I wasn't in on Wednesdays because he missed our chats. He'd do this thing where he'd let someone else go in front of him if it meant that he could come to my till instead. He would wait to one side to get served by me. Odd, but I didn't think too much of it, just thought he was a man that liked to be served by someone with a smile and had taken a liking to me. Again, we chatted when he came in. Now, this is where it got a bit more weird. We were sat down talking and he decided to really open up to me. He told me how him and his wife were going through a messy divorce. He started going into details of why. He told me he had punched his son. Now, this guy was big, like he looked like a bodybuilder. I can't remember exactly what had happened, but he had ended up smacking his wife too, I think. And here he was telling me all about it. I mean, I'm no counselor. After proceeding to tell me how big his house was, probably to try and grip my attention, he started telling me how he was living in the basement of the house that he owned and it wasn't fair. I'm going to hit her again if this carries on. Well, apparently the wife and son wanted him out and they were going to have it and not pay him for it, blah blah blah. He wasn't letting that happen, his son won't talk to him, blah blah blah. He then started asking me for advice, again. A 16 year old girl. I didn't really know what to say so I just sort of said, well everything happens for a reason I suppose. And as I went to get up he asked me to sit back down. Now I had already been sat there for near on half an hour and I know I said my managers don't mind but that's pushing it a bit. So I told him I really had to go. He carried on trying to get me to sit back down but to let me go in the end. Now, this may seem totally unrelated, but trust me, it will make sense later on. You know how in McDonald's we have the sauce pumps, right? Well, they're connected to a big bag of sauce which has a popper on the top of it. You basically pop the tube into the popper of the bag. But to Jesus Christ, this thing is fiddly. It can take me about 10 minutes just to get it connected, then to put the heavy bag in the holder on the side is another 5 minutes. It's a nightmare. Now back to the story. The sauce had run out and I had to fiddle about getting it in. Where the sauce dispenser is is right opposite from where Michael always sits. 
I could feel his eyes burning into my back as I did this, and any time I turn around, he would always be looking at me with a smile. It made me feel a fair bit uncomfortable, but hey ho, it's my job and you deal with this stuff all the time. Trust me, he's not the first person I've had perving at my bum. He came back a few more times and each time he did I felt more and more uneasy. He started being a bit more personal now, telling me he thought I was a pretty young girl and we should meet up for coffee at some point, and I politely declined. Michael then said this, Can I ask you something personal? Um, depends what it is. I can't really promise I'll answer. <laughs> are you a virgin? I'm not answering that. What size are your boobs? I have a boyfriend, and I'm not very comfortable answering these kinds of questions. Do you love your boyfriend? Would you leave your boyfriend for me? My boyfriend is behind the counter, and I don't think he'll be very happy with you asking questions like that. Well, just make sure he treats you right. You're a lovely girl. Anyway, I won't be coming back here for quite a while, so can I have your number? No, I don't think my boyfriend would be happy with that either. After that, I go to the back room to calm myself, as this was very unnerving for me. He was an older guy being very strange and asking super inappropriate questions of me. He knew my age as I had told him previously. The day continued. He had left. He had left and I continued and went home. When I woke up the next morning, I had a message on WhatsApp, a message on Facebook, and a friend request on there and an Instagram follow as well. It was Michael. I don't know how, but he had found all of my personal accounts just through my first name. The only way I can think of him finding it out is asking a colleague what my surname is and getting my number out of one of them. Maybe he was friendly with one of my other workers and got my number from them. I don't know. He had sent me a message saying how he needed to see more of my pictures, but he saw my main pictures for them and my WhatsApp photo. He had also sent me another message about how he loved looking at my butt when I was bent over crawling on the floor to fix the sauce bags, and saying all the things he would love to do to me. At that point I noped out, and I blocked him on everything. I still sometimes get messages from other accounts he has made, wishing me a Merry Christmas, etc. Even though he should have gotten the gist of me not wanting to talk to him. Luckily for me, I moved away about a week or so after that happened. Thank God. So I worked in a McDonald's in the UK, and the area my McDonald's is located isn't the best. There's a lot of druggies, alcoholics, and just overall idiots who cause trouble. I'm usually pretty good at fending for myself and shacking things off, but this encounter really, really freaked me out. So it was a couple of weeks ago, and I was working on the drive through window where you collect your food. It's not uncommon for guys to make sexual comments or any windows when they come through the drive through because they don't really have to face any consequences. However, this one guy came through the drive through and commented on my beautiful BJ lips, and he then asked me to meet him out back to put them to good use. I declined in the politest way I could manage and told him to move along as he was holding up the queue of cars. He then moved and I thought that was the end of that whole ordeal. Five minutes later, the same dude comes around again and makes even more sexual comments about me, my hair, and all the creepy things he'd like to do to me. They were quite creepy and very disgusting. They were mostly about the things he'd do to me. I was shocked and quite visibly sickened, so he drove off and I told my manager that I felt uncomfortable by this customer, and I asked to be moved to a different station in case he came back around. Well, apparently he did, because the boy who switched stations with me also had an encounter with this guy. He was asked where I was, what my name is, if this guy would give him my phone number, and if he knew where I lived and what time I finished. The boy thankfully only told him my name and that I had moved on to the front counter, but that was before he realized this guy was a total freak and decided not to say anything more. Now, this is where the story gets really weird for me. The creepy guy came into the store and came up to the till that I was stationed on. He made similar remarks about what he wanted to do to me if he were to ever get his hands on me. He didn't stop until other customers interrupted him and told him to back off and walk away because I was getting really upset and shaken. He wouldn't leave so I tried to walk away, which is when this guy tried to jump over the counter to try to get to my side of the store. Luckily my managers and a few other staff members grabbed a hold of him and stopped him getting near me 
but that didn't stop him from fighting back and still trying to touch me and get near me. At one point, he was even calling at my coworkers with his long, nasty nails. Other members of staff alerted the staff safe, a sort of panic button that connects us right to the police, who were then sent right away. Fortunately, because I work in a very rough area, police patrol very closely to where I work, so they managed to get to the store pretty quick. They detained the guy and found a few knives stashed all over his body. Army knives, pocket knives, and even just small regular kitchen knives. As they were dragging him away, he continued to scream about how he was going to wait outside the store for me every day and that we belonged together, and just screaming all of the rantings of a madman. My manager sent me home in a taxi, and I've never seen this guy, his car, or anything else of his ever again, which I thank my lucky stars for. This happened about 18 months ago. I lived alone when I was 19, and one night I decided to walk down to McDonald's like I do on occasion. I lived about one kilometer from McDonald's. It was a bit of a sketchy area, a lot of people roaming the streets and a lot of addicts and criminals. I started walking and saw two guys probably around my age on the other side of the street. In this situation, it's important to note that my house and McDonald's were on the same main street, opposite tree-dense campsites on the beach. I could feel their eyes as I walked past, but I didn't look up. They crossed the road and started walking behind me. They were close enough for me to hear them. They were close enough for me to hear them laughing and whistling. They waited at the corner as I went into McDonald's and I could see them watching. I left McDonald's through the back door, walked straight up the side street and around three blocks before I braved going back through the main road. I came out in front of them, and again, they started following me. They were steadily gaining on me. I walked as fast as I could without running because I knew they would catch up to me. I came to a corner with a 7-Eleven and turned in. As soon as I was out of their sight, I ran straight behind the store and hid between a dumpster and a bush. I just stayed there for around 20 to 25 minutes. I slowly emerged and went up to the next side street. I followed that street down until I came to a few more shops behind the main street. They were standing under a post light directly in my way. I then froze and walked backwards slowly and carefully, trying not to be seen or heard. Again, I ran around another side street and ended up looping around my house and jumping my back fence. After that, plus a couple of other similar experiences, I have serious anxiety about leaving the house by myself. I don't think I'm going to be doing that anymore. This all literally just happened within the past hour. I got out of work at 6.30pm and went to McDonald's to get an iced coffee. I pull up to the drive through and there's a red truck in front of me with a cap on the bed. It's super wide so I can't see their mirrors and thus can't get a glimpse of who is inside. I'm minding my own business listening to Unsolved Mysteries on YouTube when I see that the red truck has pulled up to the second pickup window. You know, there's the window where you pay and then the two separate windows where you pick up your food. I didn't think anything of it and just assumed they had a big order and the McDonald's employee asked them to pull up so that I could get my iced coffee. I look up to see the truck's reverse lights come on. Okay, they must have pulled up a little too far and are backing up a little. They keep backing up without signaling to me that they're backing up. I slowly back up as well and luckily no one's behind me. They keep backing up and backing up until they're finally parked at the first pickup window now. The McDonald's employee looks out the window at me, shrugs and gives me a look like, I don't know why they did that. A few minutes go by. At this point I'm just thinking about how strange it is and not part of common etiquette it was to back up without signaling to anyone you needed to do so. They could have easily hit me had I not been looking straight ahead, curious as to what they were doing. Now five minutes goes by. No one is being given any food. I just want my iced coffee, so I'm kind of annoyed that they backed up, thinking maybe they were told to go to the second window since I only needed the iced coffee. But they suddenly felt like refusing to do so would get McDonald's to get them their food faster, and thus they backed up to the first pickup window. I don't know. Anyways, I continue to sit there and wait for my food when I see the passenger door to the truck open. Out comes an older man who looks to be around 65 to 70 years old. 
He was wearing light khaki covered overalls and a dirty white t-shirt. He starts walking slowly over to my car. I'm thinking, maybe he's going to apologize to me for not signaling that they needed to back up. He gets to my passenger door window, turns so he's facing the window head on, and then just stares at me. I'm waiting for him to signal me to put my window down, thinking he had something to say. Well, he doesn't do anything. He just stands there and stares at me. He starts to lift his hand towards the door handle. I quickly lock the door. He scowls and walks back to the truck and gets back into the passenger side. They immediately drive away the second he closes his door. They didn't get any food. They didn't get anything. They just left. I pull up to the drive-thru to finally get my iced coffee and it's been well over 10 minutes at this point, but I finally head home. At this point I have more questions than answers now. Why did they back up without signaling? Why did they need to back up at all? And why did he get out of his truck? Why was he about to open my door? Why didn't he say anything? Why didn't they get their food or drinks? It might not be the creepiest thing to have happened, but this whole ordeal made me so anxious that I was shaking the whole ride home. I just wish I had some kind of insight or understanding to exactly what happened here. Definitely my most creepiest experience while at McDonald's, and I really hope I don't have another one. This happened last month, but I totally forgot about it until I read the recent story about the old creep who backed his truck up in the drive through while the OP was waiting to get a coffee, then got out and made to get into her car. My story isn't anywhere near as creepy, but still pretty creepy to me. Anyway, my daughter and I went to the drive through for a late night snack. As I was ordering, this guy ran out from the side of the building and jumped in front of my car. My little Yorkie, Obi, who was sitting in my lap, didn't like that at all. Normally he likes everyone, but why would he be friendly to some strange guy who was taking exaggerated movie slasher stomps towards my car? I stopped ordering our food while Obi went nuts, and I was alternating staring at this guy while glancing around to see if I had a quick exit in case the guy made a run for my car. The guy kept stomping forward, but now he started barking in a deep threatening voice like a large dog and staring straight at Obi. I was afraid Obi was going to jump out the window to attack, but my hands were frozen on the wheel. Then I got pissed. He was scaring my daughter and me and freaking my dog out. I had a sudden crazy thought to just gun it and run this idiot down. Move you idiot, your barking ass is standing between me and my quarter pounder. Of course, I never would have done that, but I almost reversed and drove off. Suddenly, he stopped barking and ran off the way he came. The whole thing only took about 30 seconds, but I was pretty shaken and jittery the whole drive home. My daughter thought it was funny, but not me. Maybe he meant it as a joke, but I certainly wasn't amused. For some background, we were all in our mid-twenties from the Midwest. We're all females. The first of my friends was getting married, so naturally, a bunch of us went to Las Vegas for a bachelorette party. Having never been to Vegas before, we were having a blast. The story begins on our last night out. We were at a pool party this day, and one of the girls, Brittany, got completely plastered. She had to be taken home and be put to bed, so she didn't make it out that night. We actually had two rooms on two different floors, one on like the 16th floor and one on the 6th floor. She stayed in the room on the 6th floor. There was a DJ playing a show at our hotel that night, and it was decided we would go there for convenience. The maid of honor was one of those people that knew everyone, one way or another, and an old friend was a promoter for this club. He was able to not only get us in for free, but get us a table with free bottle service. We all thought this was the most amazing thing ever and took advantage of free drinks. As many of you know, Vegas is expensive. One of the girls, Danielle, and I go to the bathroom, and by the time we make it back to the table, our party has been dispersed. The bouncer dropped us like a hot potato and told us, this isn't your table anymore. Someone bought it. We were bummed because not only did we have to go to the general peasant area, but we were now all split up. Everyone was drunk and not really responding to text, and it was way too loud to call. 
Hoping the rest of the girls were together, me and Danielle stayed and enjoyed the concert until around 2 a.m. before walking back to our rooms. She was staying in the 6th floor room, and I was on the 16th. We split up on the elevator to go to our separate rooms, but mine was already occupied by the four other girls, all passed out. I called Danielle and told her I was coming down, but she warned me that Megan was in the room crying hysterically and not sure what happened. As I get down to their room, we learn the truth. Still, one of the scariest things to happen to someone I know. As told by Megan, I was enjoying the concert until I got split up from everyone. I decided to walk back to the room as I was tired. I got on the elevator with several people, and I was the only one that got off on my floor, or so I thought. I walked to the end of the hallway, and as I put my keycard in the door, a man comes sprinting down the hall and tackles me into the room. The door shuts behind us. He climbed on top of me and punched me in the face several times trying to knock me out. All of a sudden, Brittany, who was asleep in the room, wakes up and freaks out. She gets up and starts kicking the man. He thought Megan was alone, so he naturally freaked out and ran out of the room. Her blood was all over the wall when I got to the room. Hotel security came and then said something that gave me the chills. We were able to watch him on our cameras follow you the whole way through the casino and on the elevator. He got out pretending to go the opposite direction just until you opened your room door, then he charged. The whole time you were walking, he was just behind you, watching you like a hawk. It definitely seemed like he knew what he was doing. Thank God for my other friend not making it out that night, because Megan truly could have been alone and trapped in the hotel room with that creepy guy. Also, the police never did find him. My first visit to Vegas was when I was 20 during a friend's 21st birthday party. I wasn't old enough to drink, so I had to find other means of trying to catch up with my friends. I became obsessed with trying to get one of those fat Tuesday long bottleneck slushy drinks and kept asking everyone who had one where they were getting them. This one guy dressed up in a costume and passing out flyers said he knew a place we could get one for cheap, and then we exchanged numbers, saying he would take me to get one when he was done working. He calls me and we meet up at my hotel room. At this time, I was heavily intoxicated from drinking in my room and left without saying where I was going. He told me we had to go off the strip to get the cheapest drinks and put us on a bus. The bus ride was so long and I started to sober up. It started to get dark out and when we reached our stop, there was no one around, just a bunch of abandoned buildings. I mentioned how desolate it was, and he said everyone was inside these bars, but there was no signs of any life at all. Red flags start flying off, and I start to realize that I'm in a horrible position. I get a small stroke of luck as he tells me he needs to urinate around the corner and for me to wait on him. As soon as he turned around the corner, I run as fast as I could back to the bus and get on as it was leaving the station. It was a double-decker bus. I find a seat on top and start to feel at ease. As I'm on the bus thinking I'm safe now, I see him come up the stairs and my heart drops. He sits right next to me and then goes, What happened? Why'd you leave? I told him I felt uncomfortable and my friends were wondering where I was. Thankfully my phone went off and my friends were calling me asking me where I was and as I started to give the details he got off at the next stop. He stared at me through the window and that was the last time I gave my number to a stranger. So this happened to me a few years ago when I was 15. My family and I had lived in Las Vegas and were going on what my parents called a staycation. Basically just a vacation, but without leaving the town itself. We had been staying at the Circus Circus Hotel, which is connected to this indoor amusement park called the Adventure Dome. Now that the context is out of the way, let's get to the actual story. While we were there, I became motion sick, so I went up to the hotel room to lay down until I felt a little better, as well as taking some Pepto-Bismol. I stayed there for around half an hour just for safe measure. Usually I would carry my phone with me so that if I encountered any awkward or unnerving situations, I could simply pull out my phone and pretend to be on a phone call. This time, however, I left it in the room along with anything else that may potentially fall out on a ride. 
Once I left the room, I quickly checked the hallway to see if anyone was in it, and there was a man sitting outside one of the doors, seemingly on a call. This also happened to be the direction of the elevator. As I began walking towards the elevator, he noticed me, got up, and began walking towards me. He started asking me things like, Hey, are you from around here? And, who are you with? Now, I'm extremely awkward with people and always have been, so I kept attempting to end the conversation to get him to go away with simple one-word responses, which he completely ignored. He then asked me if I'd like to go have some fun with him in his room. I was 15 and I looked possibly even younger, which was what made it a bit more unnerving in the first place since he looked to be around in his 40s. I said that I was in a rush to meet up with my family for lunch and I needed to hurry, so no. Yet, the rest of the way to the elevator and while waiting for it, he kept trying to convince me to go with him. Luckily, he at least let me be when the elevator arrived and I got on. Thank goodness there were others on it or this may have ended a bit differently. Long story short, none of us were allowed by ourselves for the remainder of the trip. I told my parents about the whole encounter once I got downstairs and my father was pissed as well as my mother. The rest of the trip went well and we didn't see him again, but still, if you're young or have no defense, be careful when walking alone. I don't really know if this was actually creepy or if it's just the anxiety talking, nor what his intents were, but either way, at the time this was creepy as hell for me. This happened a few years back, and I was traveling with a close friend and my boyfriend at the time who is now my husband. Long story short, her boyfriend was supposed to come with us as well, but they ended up breaking up a week before the trip, so it ended up just being the three of us. Anyways, being from the east side of the country and having never been to Vegas before, we wanted to be sure to see all of the sights. We went to a number of casinos, restaurants, pools, saw the Blue Man Group, went to the Hoover Dam, etc. One thing that friends had told us we had to check out while we were there on the trip was Old Vegas. We were told it was super cool and had this awesome light show at night. We'd looked it up in the travel books and had heard a lot of good things about it. At this point, we had been in Vegas for at least a couple of days already, so we were getting used to the idea that no one ever seems to sleep. And so we could make the most of our trip, we usually stayed up and stayed out pretty late as well. So when we ventured over to Old Vegas kind of late at night, we were thinking it would be like the Strip, lit up and busy at all hours of the night. Well, we were wrong. We arrived at around 1am in what turned out to be an extremely shady area dressed to the nines. My friend and I in nice cocktail dresses, and my boyfriend in dress pants and shoes and a dress shirt, and our white convertible rental car. Needless to say, we stood out. As soon as we neared the entrance for the main drag, I started to feel uneasy. It wasn't half as lit up as I thought it should be, and the streets looked kind of deserted. Also, the people who were on the streets didn't look like tourists. I swear I saw a guy walking down the street trying door handles on each parked car he passed on the street. After seeing this, I told my boyfriend that I didn't feel safe here and we probably shouldn't park on the street. Honestly, I was feeling kind of apprehensive about being there at all and would have preferred to go back to the strip, but we were already here and both him and my friends still wanted to check it out. Luckily there was a casino with a parking garage near where we were, so we ended up parking there and walking through the casino before making our way down to the street to the main street. However, as we walked through the casino, I noticed that virtually everyone in the casino was male and none of them looked like tourists. They were all practically staring a hole in our backs. My friend and I are both attractive women, and the combination of this and how we were dressed made us stick out like a sore thumb. After making our way out of the casino and over to the main street, we noticed that none of the cool lights we had been told about that make up the overhead light show were lit up. There were bums on the street asking us for money and few very other tourists. We made it to what looked to be one of the most lit up casinos on the street. My boyfriend really wanted to play $2 blackjack which he'd heard could be found here. I was just happy to be inside and away from the deserted creepy street, and I figured we'd be fine as long as we stayed inside the casino. Turns out that wasn't quite the case. We walk up to a blackjack table and almost instantly get the attention of this weird guy. 
It's been several years since this happened, so I can't even remember exactly what he looked like anymore. But he wasn't a small guy. He was probably taller and definitely bigger than my boyfriend, and he didn't look like he was all there. He kind of tried to strike up a conversation with my friend and I as we stood up by the blackjack table, but nothing he said was making any sense. He would just mumble a weird sentence or two and maybe give us an awkward compliment, then just kept standing there by us watching the activity at the table. We tried to be polite, but tried to avoid giving him too much attention, as we didn't want him to think that we wanted to engage in his conversation. After standing at the table for a while, the three of us moved on to the next table. We figured we'd lose the guy and sit down and actually get to play some blackjack. However, he followed us right over to the next table where he proceeded to stand very close by to my friend and I, and continued mumbling very weird things that we didn't understand. The only thing I made out that I could remember is he kept telling us his uncle owned the casino or something, which was most likely not true at all. This continued for a while. We would stand at a table for a while and watch, and just when we thought he was distracted enough by what was going on at the table, we would move on to another table. But yet, he continued to follow us and not at all inconspicuously. In fact, he started getting strangely aggressive. Now, as we stopped at each table, he would catch up to us, walk up awkwardly close to my boyfriend, cross his arms, and try to stare him down. We would then move, go to another table, and the whole thing would happen again. The casino we were in, again, wasn't that huge, but the main walkway was essentially a big loop. We made it around the loop twice, stopping at various intervals and trying to act nonchalant before we saw a security guard. My boyfriend was able to flag him down and tell him what was going on, and the guard began to talk to the guy while we booked it out of the casino and back to our car. We got back to the car and back to the strip in one piece, and without further incident. We never did get to play blackjack in Old Vegas or see the light show, but after that, we didn't really have a desire to go back for the remainder of our trip. But can you really blame us? My grandparents' job required them to travel across the United States in a large truck with a trailer. I traveled with them a lot and was homeschooled on the road. We lived in hotels, ate at fast food restaurants, diners, and truck stops. While most adults would probably love to travel for free and see beautiful locations like California, Nevada, Colorado, Texas, etc., I was a young girl and wanted to stay back home with my friends and family. But of course, it wasn't my decision. What my parents wouldn't understand is that as a developing child, I would be in many dangerous situations due to being in unfamiliar cities with sketchy characters. The following story happened in Nevada when I was 12 years old. After about 12 hours of being on the road with my grandparents, we finally arrived to Las Vegas for the first of our five-night stay. In order to save some money to account for the last-minute guest, me, we stayed in a cheap hotel in the not best part of town a little outside of the city. It would have been cheaper to stay there, but the hotel had complimentary breakfast, a family-friendly guarantee, and most importantly, a pool. I had been traveling with them for not even two weeks, and what would happen next would set the tone for the next year I spent on the road. My new guardians and I were all down at the pool catching rays and cooling down during the 117 degree heat. I was excited to go swim and tan because it was summer, and it was a nice break from being lectured and being punished for my bad behavior, which resulted in me being sent to live with them. I was laid out on a beach chair in a small bikini working on my tan when an older woman around 40 approached me and my grandfather. She asked if there was another member of our family still in the hotel. My grandfather replied, Um, no, my wife is the only other person here with us, and she's in the pool right there. Her face turned white and then she replied, Um, I don't want to alarm you, but I've noticed a man in his underwear at his window taking pictures of her and touching himself. We both dart our heads to the rooms facing the pool to see what she meant, and to my horror I saw the skinny disheveled man with his camera documenting my unnerved face. I could make out the satisfied smile behind the camera and saw the rapid movements of his forearm. He noticed my grandpa charging inside the hotel to find out where he was and to make sure he was dealt with. Unfortunately, he was gone before the management could check every room. It's been years since this happened and I'm still creeped out by the idea of what he was doing with those pictures of my developing body. 
I sometimes wonder how dangerous he may have been. If he hadn't been discovered by the stranger at the pool, would he have approached me? I guess I'll never really know, but I'm glad I never found out. To give a little background information about myself, I'm a 20 year old white male, 6 foot 2, 150 pounds, and I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I take the bus or walk as my regular means of transportation, and I'm not the most physically intimidating or attractive guy. I've always been pretty skinny too. I like to consider myself a people person and usually love to talk to strangers and hear their stories, and at times I love to help people through whatever problem they're facing at the time. That being said, let me get to the story. It was a Friday night about five to six years ago, and I was coming home from my best friend's house a little after midnight. Most of the time coming home from his house, I would use the same routine I have for the last seven years walk down the street about a mile and a half and catch a bus that goes through the middle of the city straight to wherever I had to go. This night was a little different. I ended up drinking a little bit too much with him and had to take a different route. No big deal, right? Well, I walked down a back street to the bus stop I had to get to and I noticed a purple slash blue Chevy Blazer parked on the side of the road with a fat man sitting in it staring at me. It creeps me out a bit, but I ignore it and keep walking. I make it to the bus stop no problems and sit on a conveniently placed pile of large rocks at the top of the bus stop and wait for the bus to arrive. I checked the bus schedule and saw that I had just over a 30 minute wait. I light a cigarette and just stare at the traffic as I wait for the bus. Nothing happens until about 7 or 8 minutes before the bus was scheduled to arrive and out of nowhere a purple slash blue blazer pulls up next to the stop and the passenger window rolls down. Sitting in the car, a fat, late 30s to mid 40s Hispanic male starts trying to talk to me. I stood up to get a better look at the guy, and I notice he's wearing something that looks like a police uniform, complete with a badge and utility belt. Keywords looks like one. The color of khaki was far too light to be a police officer, at least in the jurisdiction I was in at the time. He shined a flashlight into my eyes as I talked to him and announced that he was an officer of the law and looked at his watch and told me that the bus didn't come this late and he instructed me to get in the car and he'd give me a ride. I instantly knew something was wrong here and my first thoughts were John Wayne Gacy. I knew I needed to get out of here and get out of here fast. Now I've gotten stuck in some terrible neighborhoods, ones that someone like myself would be lucky to get out of alive before and I've had police officers pull me over to inform me where I was and that I should get out quickly, even begging them for rides once they cut me loose and they've told me no. Cops only give you a ride to jail, and I knew that. I get really nervous and the nope center of my brain goes off and start trying to say, that's okay, I'll be fine, I don't need a ride, and so on. I mean, the way this guy was talking and acting really made my skin crawl. Luckily for me, the bus pulled up behind him and I ran onto the bus to get away. As I got on the bus, I tried to memorize his license plate numbers, but he had it covered by some type of cloth, and next to the license plate read a sticker that said, I break for animals. I don't know why, but that really creeped me out even further. Nothing else happened that night, but three days later while drinking my morning coffee, I saw on the local news that a fat white male in his 40s was abducting young men driving them to the middle of the desert and then raping them and then leaving them at large for three years and he got caught cruising around the day after my encounter with him. I'm very fortunate that I wasn't his next victim. Thank God for that. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video and if you have your own personal scary story, be sure to submit that to my subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash southern cannibal or to my email at southern cannibal at gmail.com i'm always looking for new stories and before we bring this video to a close i just want to shout out all of my five dollar or more patrons as well as my three dollar or more patrons featured on screen shout out to babe lincoln beth a kate e celeste s ellie s Emily W, Heather B, Howard R, Jacqueline W, Jazzy G, Jonathan C, 
Lori J, Matthew B, Michael G, Random Randy, Steph L, Tammy Yes, and Terry A. Thank all of you so much for supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it more than you know. And if any of you would like to join these awesome people and also become a patron, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash southerncannibal. Thank you everyone, and have a good one. And remember to always stay on.